My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. The angels bow down in adoration. We bow our heads as we lift our voice, we cry, oh, holy. Jerusalem, we just bow down in adoration. We call on Him as we lift the voice. We cry, Holy, what is the name? In adoration, we join our hands as we lift our voice. We cry, Holy, what is the land? We just in adoration. We join our hands as we lift our voice. We cry, Holy, what is the land? The angels bow. do spiritual things it's important to do them with revelation there are many names you could call God you could call him love you could call him, call him light you could call him anything that you are inspired to call him but the most robust and posterior revelation of God is the revelation of him as holy because when you call him holy, what you are saying is that he is separate from every other thing. He's in a class of his own. He's apart from every other thing. So the love of God is actually a definition of his holiness. It means his love is different from every other kind of love. The life of God is a revelation of his holiness. It's different from every other kind of life. So when you call him holy, you are actually extolling him above everything that can be captured cognitively. That's why the angels don't call him love. They don't call him light. They only call him holy. Because when you call him holy, you have called him everything. It means he's standing in a class of his own. You are, you, are, you are recognizing him as creator. Why every other thing is creation. You are putting him separate in his own class. So we worship with the angels this morning. That's just the idea behind the song. It's a kind of worship that helps you to put yourself apart. And recognize him that is holy. And then you bring your heart as a token of appreciation for who he is to you. Can we go ahead and sing this song a few more times? The angels bow down in adoration. We join our hands as we lift our voice. We cry, Holy, what is the land? The angels bow in adoration. We join our hands as we lift our voice. We cry, Holy, what is the land? privilege we have this morning to congregate in your presence and bring to bear the counsel of your will for our lives. Take all the glory Father in Jesus precious name. In the precious name of Jesus. So these few days in God's presence we change the foundation of most of your lives and as you depart you discover that the comfort of God will become stronger on your soul. Good. That's it. Either the appetite will die, or it becomes difficult for you to engage in them anymore. That is when you know that the life of God has begun to walk from your inside. 
They were struggling with lying. They were struggling with many things. They just discovered that their appetite dies. It means we are beginning to operate by a new economy. And I trust God that this morning, many persons will be brought under a new economy. See, last night I came with I came with a burden to share with you, but I discovered that you couldn't bear it. So I decided to withdraw and just create a, an atmosphere of prayer so that you could receive impartation by the Holy, by the Holy Spirit. This morning we look into the scriptures. Jesus said, I have many things to tell you. He said, you cannot receive it now. So he withdrew it. But this morning you are, you are refreshed. I'm sure you are refreshed. And you are ready to receive the word of the Lord. Glory to God. John Timothy chapter 2 verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. Having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. Let every man that nameth the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. But in a grace house are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood, of tea, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purges himself from this, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. We look into the scripture that we have read. We may not have time to begin to expound on all the syllables that are there. But if you look into the scripture that we have read, you know that the emphasis of God in that scripture is on the strength of service. It's like a system strategy of recruiting people into the service of the house of God. So the people, the reference of that scripture is meant for are not the unbelievers. They are not the people in the world. And if you look very carefully, you discover that the basis for which you will be nominated for service in the house of God is a responsibility that is in your own hands. You see, if a man purges himself, so if you are not numbered in the armies of God, if you are not part of the service in the house of God, then the challenge is not with God. The challenge can be traced to the degree of sanctification that you are walking in at time. It's the extent to which you have purged yourself, the extent to which you have prepared yourself to be used of the Lord. That is the determinant factor. You see, he said the foundation of God standed sure. The word foundation in that scripture is the word system. A system of operation of the kingdom is already established. It's already defined. It cannot be moved. So he said, for you, having the understanding that this system cannot be altered, it is now your responsibility to begin to conform with it. Because the system that defines the operation and the possibilities of God around your life is a system that was fabricated from the eternal realms. It cannot change in time. The possibility of changing it does not exist. That system functions on the scale of righteousness. So for you to be numbered as a functionality in that kingdom, then you must do something to yourself consciously to bring you to a point where you can conform to the systems that are designed and fabricated for the person to be found worthy of service in the house of God. He said the Lord knoweth them that are his. So the question is not an argument as to whether you are of God or you are not of God. The basis of the argument is the extent to which you are found usable in the hands of God. There has to be a battle. A battle that will tame the possibility of the flesh in order to bring you back to align with the life of the Spirit of God for you to be relevant for service. For you to be numbered into the house of God is predicated upon the finished works of Christ. You did nothing about it. All you needed to do was to believe. And the moment you believed, you were included in the economy of God. But when you begin to talk about matters of service, then you have to drift from what Jesus had done to the level of responsibility you take on account of the grace that is provided you by the finished works of Christ. How many of you have been in a relationship before and then you discover that somehow the relationship was not working and then you come together and you formally end the relationship? and say, well, we have seen that this is not going to work, so the best thing to do is for us to go separate ways. You know, legally, you end the relationship at the point of interaction. But you will discover that after you have separated, your heart will still be connected. So legally, the relationship is over, but organically, you will have to undergo certain spiritual surgery to come to a point where your soul is detached. So there is a legal aspect of the dealings of God. There is an organic aspect. 
The unfortunate thing is that the legal aspect does not culminate in spiritual experience. What culminates in spiritual experience is the organic dimension. Just like you can tell the guy, get out, I don't need you anymore. But when you go home, you discover you will be on your pillow and you will wet it with tears. And for many weeks, you still be there crying because you have altered a separation. You have severed the separation, let the, the relationship legally. But organically, your heart is still involved. There are lots of things you will do for your heart to be separated from that relationship for you to regain your freedom again. That is the complexity in dealing with an entity that has a spirit, a soul, and a body. The things that are real in the spirit, for them to become an experience in your soul, there are processes you must undergo before you can lay hold on them. So Jesus Christ, on account of the finished work, has numbered you and I to become a part of the family of God. But for you to be usable in the hands of God, there are lots of things that must take place in your soul. So the Bible said the foundation of God is standard short. Sure. Before you were born from the realms of the mortars, you may have been ordained to be a prophet. But it is possible for you to come to time and never work in the office of the prophet until you go back to eternity. So you will be part of the family of God, but in the ranking system of Zion, you will not be relevant. Because according to the ordination, for you to be relevant, you must have to trade with the economy of your ordination in time. And the extent to which you fulfill it is the extent of value you will have with God. And that is the warfare of darkness against your soul. You know, when Jesus was born, the wise men from the east, they saw his star and they knew that this one is going to be great. They knew that this one that was born was born to be a king. So when Jesus was about seven days old, they trekked from their world to come and pay obeisance and honor to the one that is born to be a king. Meanwhile, he was a child. But in the spirit realm, what he is has already been defined. It is possible for darkness to peek through the vistas of the divide to find out that you, there is something God has written concerning your destiny. And Satan will begin to fight it even before you know it. Because Satan realizes that the day you know it and begin to walk in it, you will not only constitute a force that will destroy his kingdom and operational system on earth, will begin to gain relevance with God. Because the organic dimension is the most important dimension. The legal dimension does not need your participation. So you didn't know what Jesus had to go through for you to be saved. And you don't even need to know it. But when you believe it, what happens is that it is downloaded into your spirit as an operating system. And the moment it is downloaded into your spirit as an operating system, the Holy Ghost begins to work on that operating system to bring your soul into the experience of the things that are real in your spirit. Whether you will cooperate with the Holy Spirit to enter into the reality or not, is what will determine whether you will be relevant to God or not. Unfortunately, Christianity in our day is a Christianity that denies responsibility. So we come into the body of Christ, we come into church, we come into the assembly of God's people, and then we carry out the normal religious activity. But when we go back, our life is not a definition of God. If we continue like that, many of us will walk through this realm, walk through this world, and we will not even know that God was interested in us. Your life will be a function of trial and error every day. You'll be there begging God and hoping for God to show you mercy when heaven is actually waiting for you to manifest. Because what heaven wants to achieve in time is the level. You may be there crying every day for God mercy on you. Whereas heaven is waiting for you to move out. But moving out in this context is not a zealous activity. Moving out is first of all a function of concentrating yourself to God. So that God can purge you and bring you to a point where you can walk from. That is the most difficult aspect of Christianity. We hear a lot of stories in scriptures. We hear a lot of possibilities. People having encounters with angelic beings. God using people mightily to do great stunts. It's not because they were special. Because the Bible says God is not a respecter of mercy. If you want to know how to enter into that spot where you can become very significant in the agenda of God, then you must find out the things that they did to put their soul and to make their soul become alive. Because the moment your soul is worked upon, your soul, be your soul becomes a reflector, a, reflex a reflector of the possibilities that are in the realm of the spirit. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. Kadosh, Kadosh. You are mighty. Don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. I'm giving the keyboard guy a sequence that he will follow. We need to be calm this morning to be instructed. I don't want it to be like last night. No, let's be calm and hear certain things that will sink into our spirit. By the way, my friend is here, Pastor Philip Cephas. Celebrate God's servant.
for the kingdom of God to move forward, men must put labor. Men must put in labor. If labor is not part of, of your work with God, the kingdom will never advance. When the kingdom of God wants to advance, first of all, it begins to advance in your life. God will first of all begin to shut down the protocol of darkness in your life. When God succeeds in shutting down that dimension of darkness in your life, then you become an extension of the hand of God. Because the foundation of God stands sure. God cannot use you except God have walked through you. If God is not walked into you, God cannot be walked out of you. The first, the first thing is for God to be walked into you. You know, we are a generation of many revelations, mighty revelations. Young men with many titles, young men saying a lot of things on Facebook, on internet, online. And they want to destroy the name and the integrity of people who have gone ahead. So here is a small boy who just started working with God two days ago. He first of all picks the father and begin to pull him down and say this thing is, is rubbish. This is not correct. This should be like this. Meanwhile, every revelation he has has not been proven. People say all kinds of things. People call themselves Christians. They come into leadership in the body of Christ and then you commit young brethren to their hands to help raise them in the way of God. And then before you discover, pastor have impregnated three people. Because God has not been walked into them. They make a show of themselves as being spiritual. But you don't walk out in spirit. A spirit breaks out of you. The extent to which a spirit takes hold of you is the degree to which it manifests himself through you. If a spirit has not been able to take hold of you, the possibility of breaking out through you does not exist. Because these matters are organic. They are not things that are cerebral. You can know about a spiritual thing in your head, but to steward it, has, it has to be committed to you. Many people are not committed with substance in the kingdom. And that is why it looks as if darkness is having a free day. I want to show you what it takes for you to be used of God. But you may not understand it until you are able to see the extent and the degree to which darkness have prospered in your life and in your territory. Because before God uses you to deliver a territory, before God uses you to deliver a civilization, God will first of all separate you from that civilization. Because the institution that trains you, you don't have the power to correct it. Your thinking process, your ideologies and philosophies will be a product of the intelligence of that institution. So God will help, first of all pull you away from that institution. Take you to a place where you are completely under his government. And then he will train you. He will work on your vision, work on your configuration until you become a complete spectacle that reflects his dimension. That gate of concentration is where many Christians are running away from. The world that trained the way you think is the world you are coming to challenge. And what you don't know is that what you see around you are actually physical representation of spirits that are unseen in the realm of the spirit. What you call a thought is actually a whisper of a spirit. What you call a trend is actually a manifestation of a spirit. What you call an act taking place is actually a spirit rigorously at work in the territory. You see people being massacred and butchered. You think it's the violence of men. What you don't know is that it's a spirit that has taken over that territory. You will find yourself struggling in a territory trying to stand for God. You don't know that the foundation of that territory has been weaved with demonic intelligence. So before you can represent God in that territory, you must break through that foundation and find the taproot of your spirit connected to the fountain of God before you can be able to bring out the dimensions of God in the territory. You come to a territory, you suddenly begin to see that lost. Every day you wake up, lost have attacked your heart. You don't know that the atmosphere of that territory is already enveloped with the spirits of lost. So most times we think that the things happening around us are sets of circumstances. But one thing we need to know is that everything in this visible creation is a manipulation from the spirit realm. Everything you see and know is a manipulation from the spirit realm. Your belief system is a manipulation from the spirit realm. The way you respond to things, the way you act is a manipulation. The things you do in the public and do in the hiding, they are all manipulations of spirits. You are actually giving expression to different spirits at the same time. But you don't understand. The only way you can become a reflector of God completely is when you are consecrated to Him. Because any spirit you con con connect yourself with, you become a traffic for that spirit. Your life becomes a gate through which that spirit can break into the visible world. And I told us yesterday that the natural creation is the realm of manifestation. So every spirit in the supernatural wants to be given expression to in this realm. And the only gate between the spirit and the natural is an entity called man. And that possibility is there because of the way man was created. Man is created with a spirit that came from the spirit realm. 
I told us yesterday that the substance for creating man is the spirit of God himself. The word used for creation in Genesis 1 26 is the word bara. That means to formulate out of nothing. So man was removed from the inside of God. So a component of man has its root in the spirit. And then the body that the spirit was put into was crafted from the ground. So another component of man has a physical dimension. It is the interfacing between the spirit and the body that creates what you call the soul. So the soul was not created. The soul was not formed. The soul became. The soul is the product of the interaction between spirit and body. The soul is the, is the product of the interaction between the invisible and, and the natural realm. So every time a man stands, the man is a bridge between the spiritual and the natural, whether he knows it or not. What knowledge we have him to do is to align with one spirit so that he is a transmitter of a of spirit. But if he doesn't have knowledge, he will just be an open, an open transmitting device for any spirit that wants to find expression to flow through him. Did you read the story of Peter and Jesus Christ? Jesus wanted to to have his dimension revealed in this world. And then he asked them, Who do men say I am? And Peter, by the Spirit of the living God, spoke and he said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. At that time, Peter was a transmitter of the dimensions of God. But few minutes later, the same Peter that spoke directly from heaven put Jesus aside and began to rebuke him for one. Meanwhile, the death of Jesus is according to the eternal purpose of God to bring salvation to mankind. And Jesus looked at Peter and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. So it is possible for a man in a moment to traffic both the God dimension and the Satan dimension. What concentration does for you is that it makes you become monotransmitter. A monotransmitter that only transmits God. And that is why concentration becomes the heaviest molecule. If you saw the scripture we read, the major emphasis is on concentrating to God. Say, if a man watches himself, if a man separates himself and consecrates himself unto the Lord, he will be meet for the master's use. Because the use of God is not to take advantage of your natural abilities. God does not use your natural abilities. And you sustain to the least potential when you subscribe to your natural abilities. You may think because you are an orator, your oratory power is what will give you a place in destiny. That will be your least potential. Your greatest potential can only be realized in God. When you connect with God, the least thing God can do through you becomes the greatest potential you have. But you subscribe to your natural, your least potential when you subscribe to your natural abilities. So every Christian must make it a point of duty in his life. Concentrate himself to God so that his life becomes a gate through which God can reveal his dimension. When Satan came into the garden, he, he didn't bother to attack the trees. It was a waste of time. It was a waste of resources. When he came into the garden, there were many things for him to go to. He didn't bother to go to anything. He went straight to man because man is the bridge. He knew that if he gets man, he will now have access into the physical world. Because the way God designed the creation, God designed everything and then he locked it in man. If you can open man up, then you can have access into the natural. The spirit realm was locked away from the natural realm. The only possibility of invading the natural realm was a gate that was locked into man. And Satan found it out. And the moment he found it out, he went to create an opening for him to find expression. And the man gave him an opening. Then darkness began to multiply on the face of the earth. You know, when we talk about putting yourself and concentrating yourself, you will think it's only about sin. The sin you commit and all of that is deeper than that. Darkness has three dimensions. That's where we begin from this morning. Darkness has what? Has three dimensions. The first dimension of darkness is that darkness is a civilization. If Satan comes for you, you are not the only person he's interested in. He wants to use you to create a system, a web, that will enslave a territory and create a philosophy that will make it easy for him. That ground becomes a fertile ground for him. So when Satan is entering into your life, your family is in view. All he's looking for is a gate. When Satan is entering into your life, <laughs> your territory is in view. You are the one who doesn't know the significant role you are supposed to play in your territory. You know, most times when you are growing because of the selfish nature of man, you think it's about you and you alone. <laughs> Anything that breaks out through you has a direct implication on you, an implication on your family, and an implication of your territory. Go on Facebook now and put your picture naked. By the time you check next week, there will be 50,000 views. You will become a chamber through which 50,000 people can be touched. And one thing you don't know is that that is the natural one you can see. What spirit inspire you to say? When you say it, you have, you have released a negative energy into the creation. 
because of some of the things you utter, some spirit will become energized to walk in this earth. Because the balance of energy is between light and darkness. Every time you give expression to a demonic inspiration, what you have done is that you have contributed to the negative energy of this world. That energy you have created through anger, through evil thought, have contributed to the creation. That's why Jesus said, every idle word you speak, you will account for it. You don't know that your utterances and your thoughts are creating a fertile ground for darkness to find expression. And because you don't know, Satan will take advantage of you for long. That's why you can lie on your bed for two days. The, the being is not telling you to go and sleep with anybody. But he's just choking your heart with evil thoughts. So you can lie on the bed and be thinking on immoral thoughts only for two days. The, 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 the being will be fertilizing it. What he's doing is that that thought you are emitting in the spirit realm is a negative radar. You are choking the surrounding. You are choking the surrounding. A point will come when that energy becomes strong in that territory. And demons, other demons will have access to walk there. It's just like the intensity of the Holy Spirit may not be strong in the meeting until we pray and worship for a long time. What we are doing is that we are choking the atmosphere with an ambience where his operation can be flexible. So you see that when the place becomes charged, it becomes flexible for the Holy Ghost to operate. That's the same way demons operate. But they will get you and I to saturate the ambience of the territory with darkness so that they can find expression. What they are interested in, interested in doing is to create a civilization and you are their agent. So when he says if you put yourself, you become a gate through which God breaks into a territory. He says something deeper than sin because darkness is a civilization. Darkness is a system and darkness is a government. There are three spheres for the operation of darkness. And if you explain your life very carefully, you discover that you are connected to it in one way or the other. So when we begin talking about purging yourself today, you will begin to see the things you need to separate yourself from. Some of you are engrossed in the civilization of darkness. Some of you are engrossed in the systems of darkness. Some of you are enslaved to the government of darkness. Oh, you are mighty on your throne. Darkness as a civilization is a revelation of how far you have gone away from God. So you come to a point where you check yourself. Check yourself, you discover that your philosophies and ideologies are not consistent with the mind of God. They talk about marriage, and the young man say, We we are egalas, we don't marry Igbos. <laughs> it's not a sin, it's a civilization. It has created a philosophy and a thought pattern. That thing will short circuit the flow of the life of God. You come, they say, you need to give for the advancement of the kingdom. Say, forget all those men of God that, that wants to eat people's money. It's a civilization. It has created a thought pattern that makes you think differently from how God thinks. So if you check your life carefully, most of the things that power your convictions and the things you do, they are the things you heard from your fathers that, that are unbelievers. They say, we, we don't do it like this. Who are the we? It's a civilization. A network that is separated from God. A civilization speaks of the degree to which you are far from God. And many people, they are not necessarily sinners. But they are far away from God. Their thinking process, their philosophy, does not reveal the dimension of the wisdom of God. It's a civilization. The second thing darkness is, is that it's a system. It's a system. You see, as a civilization, your way of life is different from the recommendations of God. As a system, it speaks of the degree to which God is no longer part of you. Are we together now? It speaks of how the degree to which God is no longer part of you. So you can wake up every day and carry out your activity from morning to evening without the input of God. That is a system that has been built around your life. Some is when we go back in the night and we are tired and we say, Holy Spirit, we love you. I love you, Jesus. Ah, Lord, have mercy. Thank you for today. Ah, I will sleep. Meanwhile, you spent more than 23 hours, 50 seconds without God. It's a system. You woke up in the morning, the time you woke up, you are already late, so you are rushing to go and meet other things. God is no longer a cardinal in future life. That is darkness at work. What all of those possibilities do is that 
make it easy for them, the devil to have a free day in life. And the way the devil does it is that, first of all, it comes with something that looks attractive. And then you think it's good. There is a good in Satan that ends in death. When he allows you to be ruled by that system for long, a point comes where he begins to bring other dimensions of his reality to your life. And if you follow that path for long, the time will come to discover that what you call your life is no longer your life. At that point, that led to the government. The devil cannot enslave you and force you to do things against your will. It begins as a philosophy that takes you away from God. And then it comes to a point where it doesn't allow God into you anymore. And then it comes to where God is completely appropriated from your faculty. And the devil becomes the God of your life. At that time, the devil can force you to do things that you don't want to do. Darkness is a civilization. Darkness is a system. Darkness is a government. So when we speak about purging yourself, we are talking about from getting every protocol of darkness from your life. You will shut down the civilization of darkness in your life that makes you very far away from God. And it may culminate in lifestyles. It may culminate in thinking patterns. It may culminate in philosophies. You will remove all of them from your life. When we speak of a system, most of those things that make it difficult for you not for, for God not to have a free way into your life, you begin to fight those things consciously. So you create a time where you just go and wait on God. You don't have a prayer point where you stay there. Because you are trying to create a new system within you. Most times when we go there, you will be sleeping. Stay there. You are creating a new possibility on your inside. And then you come to a point where God becomes the Lord of your life. It is people that God is the Lord of your life that he uses. When God is the Lord of your life, he means he's the owner. The word Lord is translated in the Old Testament as Adonai. It means ownership. So he has the right, a right to manipulate your destiny and to compare you to good things. And you will still be just because you willingly surrendered your will to him. So when Paul was going to Jerusalem, they tried everything to stop him. They say, I go to Jerusalem bound in the spirit. That man is not the same with you. Both of you are Christians, both of you are saved. But that one has become a prisoner of Jesus. He has graduated to a point where Jesus has the right of way in his life. And anything Jesus gets him to do, Jesus is still just. Because he willingly chooses to submit his life. That's when you walk with God until you come to a point where death for you becomes a privilege. Some people may never get to that point in their life. Because they don't come to a point where God is Lord. When you come to a point where you are able to remove the civilization of darkness from your life, you have moved closer to the altar of darkness. If you come to a point where you remove darkness as a system, you have moved closer. At that point, Jesus is cardinally involved in your life. So anything you do, you find the mind of God. That's when you come to a point where a teacher and a doctor comes to ask your hand in marriage. And you are not jumping on the doctor because he has a better possibility in the natural world. You are going to check with God first. Is this teacher your will for me? Or is he the doctor? If he says he's the teacher, even though he, he has worked with one sander until the sander is bored, you may choose the teacher. Because at this point, God has the right of way in your life. And you have known that with God, your life and destiny will be better and secure. So you submit it to him even when it doesn't look appealing to the natural. It's at that point that God can trust you and commit to you. Because when we talk about service, the God we are dealing with, it's not a father. The God we are dealing with is a king. And when a king good can no longer be processed in your mind, you only think evil continuously. What he's trying to do is to secure you for the day of your manifestation. The day you enter into power, at that time you become a tool in his hands. So what you call a life is actually sequences of intelligence flowing from the life of spirits. Your life is actually a manifestation of the progression of spirit thoughts and intelligence. Everything you have done since the day you were born till now, especially from the time you became wise to make your own discussion, decision and manipulations of spirits, you are only enforcing the thought patterns of spirits. In Genesis chapter 1, God began the protocol 
of creation. I want to show you what it means to be separated from God in a very graphic sense. Then you will, you will x-ray it with your life and see the things that are happening with you. God decided to create a man that carried his image, that bore his image and had the possibility of revealing his likeness. That was the intention of God. And the reason God designed man that way is because God wanted to constantly have intimacy with man, fellowship and koinonia with man. The way he designed man is such that his spirit can alight upon man. You see, anything that must host a spiritual dimension must be created in the image of that spirit. For a spiritual reality to be able to manifest in time, then the reflector of that spirit or that spiritual reality must be the image of that thing that is in the spirit in the natural. So you saw that before God created Eden as an atmosphere of heaven, there was first of all Eden in heaven. If you read the book of Ezekiel 28 verse 13, you hear that Eden was in the mountain of God. So when God decided to build Eden in time, it was easy for God to fluctuate between the spiritual and the natural. Because what was in the spirit, a prototype, is only a prototype of what is in the natural. So if God stood in Eden in heaven, God can also stand in Eden on earth. So you will never see a record of when God broke into Eden. You just hear that the voice of God came walking in the garden. Because that garden was in heaven. God only downloaded the same dimension in the natural. Alright? It's like um, a principle in physics you call resonance. When two opposing waves operate or flow at the same frequency, their intensities are harmonized and then they become one. So when something is in the spirit and in the natural, that thing becomes one. So you can be in the natural and be in the spirit. You can be in the spirit and in the natural. For example, when God wanted to create a temple for him to dwell in, he told Moses to create after the pattern that was shown to him in the mount. So the temple that Moses built in the wilderness was a reflection of the temple that was already in heaven. So if God wanted to show up in that temple, thank you, he doesn't need to leave heaven. The one on earth is a reflection of the one in heaven. So there is a oneness that is achieved. That was how God designed man. He designed man with his own spirit. So if God wanted to show up and relate with man, he doesn't need to travel. It's, it's, it's like by location. A by locational reality. You are in heaven, you are on earth at the same time. You see, that's the, that's, that's the way you are now. The only thing is that most of you don't have the experience of it. As you are seated here now, you are also seated with Christ in the heavenly places. You are actually living in two times. Meanwhile, by location is different from translocation. Translocation is the ability to move and live in different geographical locations at different times without the agency of natural, you know, possibilities. So you can be here and then move to your house in Lagos, move to Kano, come back. You transport. It's like teletransportation. Translocation is different from by location. By location is actually living in the same locations at the same time. So because of the way man was completely created, Man's spirit is currently seated in heaven in the spirit with God. And man's body that is on earth here still houses a dimension of his spirit. Are we together now? So God created man like that so that God could relate and interface with man easily and have experience and fellowship with man. But that was what the devil truncated when he made man to rebel against God. When man rebelled against God, a protocol was set in place, a protocol of creating a spirit civilization. You will notice that God removed man from the garden not because God wanted to send man away from his presence. God removed man from the garden because he didn't want man to have access to the tree of life. Because if the man began to eat of the tree of life, he will be perpetually damned. He will receive eternal life as a condemned creation. So man will be eternally condemned the way Satan is. Are we together? So God decided to expel man from the garden to preserve the tree of life. So that that eternal life can be given back to man after he's redeemed. But as man left the garden, man was still in Eden. Remember, the garden was in Eden. Eden is the presence of God. The garden was planted in the realms of the presence of God. So God removed man from the garden, but he still left him in Eden. Are we there now? So man was still in Eden, but he was no longer in the garden. So that he doesn't have access to eternal life and be eternally condemned. You will notice that Cain and Abel constantly had interaction with God. When Cain decided to slay Abel and God came and asked him, he said, where is thy brother? He said, am I my brother's keeper? That's not a man who is alien to the voice of God. That's a man that is acquainted with the voice of God. He knows the voice of God. And the way he responded to God is a sign 
that he hears God. But the only problem at this point is that he was already traveling away from God. So the voice of God doesn't have authority in his life anymore. The first thing you will notice when you begin to go away from God is that the voice of God no longer has authority in your life. So you will discover that where you are going to is wrong. What you want to do is wrong. The Holy Ghost is telling you no, no, no. But the voice no longer has authority. If you come to a point where the voice of God no longer has authority in your life, it means you are already traveling away from God. At that point, you need, you, you need intensive care unit to be reconsecrated back to God. You say, am I my brother's keeper? <laughs> he didn't know that the one talking to him was not Elohim. The one talking to him was a judge. Because the utterance that God was bringing to him was a conclusion that was arrived at in the courts of heaven. He didn't know that the blood of Abel had traveled to heaven already and had an verdict that had already been passed. Because there are nine voices that speak in the courts of heaven. One is the voice of the blood. I don't have time to go there now. The only difference between you and I now is that since we are in Christ Jesus, the voice of God, the blood of God speaks for you and I. That's why you are forgiven. If you go and study the New Testament, you discover everywhere the word forgiveness is used in respect to man. It's in the past tense. Go and check it. You are forgiven. Because the blood is speaking for you in the courts of heaven. So allegations can no longer be brought against you. No matter how the devil tries to bring an allegation, there is a voice speaking for you. That voice speaks in heaven that the claims of divine justice have been met. So you have been declared justified. That's what the blood speaks in heaven. But at this time, Christ had not resurrected. So the blood of Abel went to speak against Cain. And Cain did not know that the one that came to speak to him was a judge. He knew God as a father. So they could fall like this and they will be pampered. They will fall like this, they will be pampered. This time around, the God that came, came with the two of judgment. And he said, the blood of thy brother is trying to leave from the ground. And a curse was released upon him. I don't want to begin to open that because we will, we will deviate from where we are going. And then after Cain was cursed, you discover that in Genesis chapter 4, from verse 16, the Bible says, Cain departed from Eden. When the civilization begins to grow, what happens is that you will walk away from the presence of God. That's why most of you now, even though your spirit desires the presence, is the hardest thing for you to create. You can be healthy for 30 hours, but the moment you go to the presence of God to talk to the Lord, that's when you begin to sleep. Because what you don't know is that your allegiance to the philosophy of darkness makes you to walk away from the presence. You are no longer used to your natural habitat. When you come to the house of God, that's when your greatest weakness begins to find expression. Because you have departed. You are still the child of God, but you have departed from the presence. And when you leave the presence of God, a lot of possibilities begin to play out. The first thing that Cain did was that he built a city in the land of Nod, and he named it after his son, Enoch. There are two things that happen there. Deep civilization is beginning to gain momentum. The first thing that happened is that Cain decided to create something else that we completely encompass him and separate him eternally from God. The city was an enclave that was built around himself so that he can no longer perceive of the presence. When you journey from God for long, a point will come when the voice of God becomes cast. Even when you decide to try to hear the voice of God, it will be hard because you have built a city around yourself. You have built a new civilization around yourself because you have gone away from the present. That's when you discover that every decision you make, every choices you make are a function of philosophies apart from the mind of God and the word of God. That time, you are completely secluded from God. That one is the principle of seclusion. A man who leaves the presence of God comes to a point where he's secluded from God. It becomes difficult for his spiritual senses to discern the presence of God. Even if you bring him to church and the power of God is moving, he'll just be looking like this. People are crying and weeping because God is touching them. He'll be looking like this. What is happening? He will throw outside first. He wants to take fresh air before he comes back. That man, there's a city built around him. He has been secluded. That's how the civilization of darkness grows. And then the next thing is that the city he built, he consecrated it to his son Enoch. Idolatry begins to rise. You come to a point where your hair is your God. So you can go and fornicate to receive money to buy a Brazilian wig. Idolatry. 
there is a new God now in your life apart from the God of heaven. You may not go and kneel down and say, I'm worshipping another thing. But what you don't know is that the action you are taking in the spirit realm is a statement. Hope you know in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, the Bible says God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that you can think or say. So whether you are saying it with your mouth or you are emitting it through your thought, it's still a statement in the spirit realm altogether. So your action is actually a product of your thought pattern. You come to a point where your physical appearance is your God. You can do everything that is despicable in the night so that in the daytime you can be appear you can be appealing to people. You have come to a point where your looks have become your God. So Cain began to pioneer idolatry, bringing you to a point where you can commit yourself to other things apart from God. There are some that slept with many lecturers in order to have a degree. The certificate they were fighting for is their God. Because when they go out, they feel their life will have no meaning apart from the certificate. But when you check many people who are making exploits in this world, you will discover that most of them are not working by certificates. They are working by the abilities that they receive from spirit. Because it's spirit that rules the world. Fraternity with spirit is superior to everything you have in the natural. Fraternity with spirits. A lady can give away her body because she wants to pass a course and end up with a certificate. A paper that can be torn overnight. A paper that can be eaten by rats. So you discover that the value system is altered. The things that matter to you, your priorities, are now mundane things, natural things. You see a lady go to sleep around because she needs 4,000 to make her. She has come to a point where something else has become her God. Her life is now consecrated to different spirits apart from the Lord. Those were the things Cain began to pioneer. And he didn't stop there. He began to birth different generations that were growing in this dimension of civilization. Gave birth to Irad. Irad gave birth to Matusaye. Matujae. Matujae gave birth to Matusae and Matusae gave birth to Lamech and Lamech took to himself two wives. The first time it was just Cain departing from the presence of God. At this point now, if he wants to return, it will be difficult. One, there is a city that will prevent him from coming back to God. Two, there are new philosophies that, we, that have bowed him. He already has another God. So that guy comes to church and you tell him he needs to commit his substance to God. It's impossible for him. He can't imagine it. Because he has a gear he needs to impress with money. You see, when he had not departed from God, it was easy. God said, bring an offering for me. And then they gathered offerings and came to God. You know, him and Abel were all sentenced away from the garden. At that point, man had not departed from God. So it was easy for God to call them back. So you fall and God said, come. And then you rise and come back to God. But when you come to a point where you have traveled and you have built a city and you have drifted into idolatry, it will become very hard. The guy took two wives. He pioneered what you call polygamy. You know why? His appetite for intimacy had become big. There was no longer satisfaction. Because what was the product, the object of intimacy he had was the presence of God. Now he, the presence of God has departed from him so much and that appetite for intimacy is growing. And nothing can fill it anymore. So he needs more than one woman now to bring satisfaction to his lust. I've counseled with many young people. You'll be shocked that sometimes a young lady of 19 have aborted four times and she has slept with men that she has forgotten the number. 19 years. You see, the, your growth process in this civilization is not a function of age. It's a function of grace. So if the devil gives you enough grace, what you will do at the age of 19, somebody else will not be able to do it at the age of 50. And the same way if you connect to God and his grace works in your life, what you will be able to do, a man of 80 years may not be able to do it. Timothy was the bishop of Ephesus at the age of 17. According to church history. He was ordaining elders in that church. 
Because growth in the spiritual radar is not a function of age, it's a function of grace and the supply of the spirit that you are committed to. Lamech began to explore appetites in the spirit. He would not have enough to satisfy his lust anymore. So he had to subscribe to two women. He had to subscribe to things. That's why you find yourself you're on Facebook from morning to night. You want to hear new things. Your lust is growing. If you're not on Facebook, you connect to a movie. You are watching the movie. Immediately they take light. You are looking for a friend. You want to keep talking. There is lust. Your spirit, the vacuum is growing. The vacuum is growing. But you are not schooling yourself in the way of the spirit to saturate it with the presence. So you find out that you constantly need noise and distraction in your spirit. Your phone goes down. You are looking for power bank. They say there's no light for three days. Then you see four people sharing one power bank. When you charge for 15 minutes, you give this one to charge for 15 minutes. There's nothing. They, they don't want to make any important call. They need to be online because the lost is growing. They need that distraction to constantly. Because the truth is that when you separate from God, your spirit man, which is your reality, will be calling you from eternity. That's why most times when you see, you find out you feel bad. Your spirit man is the grieved one. What he's trying to do is to bring correction to the natural man. You are looking for distraction because the moment you are quiet, the voice of eternity will begin to trouble you. So as the phone shut down, they will go and carry what? So you see folks sit down playing what? They are looking for distraction. Their appetite is robust. There's nothing that will saturate it anymore. Lamech came to a point where he couldn't satisfy his appetite anymore. So he took one wife. It was not enough. He took another one. The civilization of darkness was growing. It was growing. It was growing. At first they thought it was just to leave God. They don't need him. But now they have discovered that their own physical system is beginning to rebel against them. Because we were designed to be dependent on spirits. You were created deliberately with a vacuum. And only spirits can satisfy that vacuum. Some think power is their greatest lust. When they reach power, then they, they discover that it's not enough. So they want to go again and again and again. So you see a man of 80 years is still struggling to come into power. He just needs to be doing something that saturates his appetite. Because that thing has grown so big. Some subscribe to drink beer. He need to hide until they become nuts, you know. So that experience, that euphoria they feel, it satisfies them momentarily. But what they don't know is that you were created to only find intimacy in God. And the more you depart from God, the more your system will rebel against you. It's your system rebelling against you that you are trying to atone for with all those distractions, but it will never suffice. You can even manage it like that until the day you depart from this world. Those last moments where you are to give out your last breath, you will discover that that vacuum will stare you in the face again. That's why most people, when they want to die, they become afraid. You know why? The spirit realm begins to open to them. The things they hear are stories. They begin to see the reality. Suddenly, the spirit realm becomes real. What they told them and they thought were stories now is becoming real to them. Their spirit is about to depart from their body. And then they find out that they never had intimacy with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the vehicle that will carry them through the dark waters of the great divide. That's what the devil wants to do to you. You may stand up and say, well, thank God I'm not fornicating. Thank God I'm not a drunkard. Thank God I'm not doing this. Thank God I'm not doing that. But where are you standing in God? Elijah came before the king. He said, before God, whom I stand, there shall be no rain or dew. The man God uses is the man of the presence. There shall be no rain or dew. He knew where he was standing. Some of us don't even know where we are standing in God anymore. We have traveled so much now that we don't know whether it's at the point of the city building or it's at the point of idolatry or it's at the point of lust. We don't know anymore. We have journeyed very far. The, the Bible says Adam gave birth to two persons, Jabba and Juba. <laughs> it was Jabba that began to create a job he was the father of them that dwelt in tents and reared cattle. They are trying to sustain themselves now. That's where you get to where you think your certificate is your God. But most times, for those who are called, this is not for everybody. This is not for everybody. For those who are called, 
the Holy Ghost may allow you to prostrate yourself and look for job for 10 years. Maybe you finish NYC at the age of 27 or 25. Then you are hustling very quickly to apply for the job. To apply for the job. You apply this year, it didn't happen. You go and fast and pray for 30 days. Next year you say, I must get it this year. After some time, you are 28. Most of the job you check online, they will now say 27 and, and below. <laughs> Then fear begins to enter your heart. You now come to a point, you wake up, you discover you are 33. You can't apply for any job again. At that point, you now go back to God and say, what is your will for my life? <laughs> you have traveled too far. <laughs> now, you have exhausted all your possibility in the flesh and it didn't suffice. So you are compared to come back to the monarch of Zion. The one who is called the El Shaddai. You don't know that your sustenance is in his hands. He's called the multi-breasted one. He suffices all things, but he suffices by none. His essence does not deplete. He can feed a thousand people in a day, and it will not reduce anything from him. The only thing he doesn't increase is that he's the fullness of all things. There's no possibility of increasing him. Neither can he deplete in essence. You know, if you were John the Baptist, some of you don't know what is fighting you. You don't know it's your ordination. Why you want to get into any relationship and it doesn't work? Your womb is supposed to be a gate where God will raise generous for his kingdom. But you want to follow that boy that has sweet mouth. Or because you saw one or two things around him and you think the anointing will allow you. That anointing will fight the relationship. The anointing will fight the relationship. So you will have four breakups in one year. Go and cry. When you cry, the Lord will mend your heart. Because your womb from eternity have been destined to be a gate for the unveiling of generals. God will fight until that womb is preserved. You will come to a point in God where your ordination begins to speak so loud that God will fight. Your sufficiency becomes his jealousy. There is no doctrine of prosperity you will teach John that will work. Because in his own blueprint, he is supposed to come in the spirit of Elijah. And Elijah dwelt in caves. So if you like, come and show him all the principles of prosperity. It did not work. So when the young man discovered it, he left his father's house. His father was one of the ranking priests. In fact, he was the head of the priest in the order of Abia. So lack was not part of him. He didn't need to have lack in his life. But the guy knew that he had seen the blueprint of his ordination. So he knew cooperating with it is the best thing for him. So he departed and went to live in the wilderness until the day of his showing forth unto Israel. Because his life will only be meaningful if he's able to identify the Messiah. When they asked him, who art thou? He didn't say, I am John the Baptist. He said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. He knew the blueprint. I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. They came, they said, why are you baptizing? He said, the one that sent me, the same said unto me. He said, the one upon whom the spirit will descend and rest is the chosen one. So his baptismal service was not an, it's a religious act. It was a spiritual strategy to reveal the Messiah. So everything the guy did, his philosophies, his ideologies, were all powered by the wisdom of the divine. Because he decided to separate himself unto the Lord. The reason the devil will want you to travel far away from God and wander in deserts and wilderness is because the more you go away from God, the more your, your ordination becomes obscure to you. Some of you, when you were much younger, you say, God will use me, God will use me. Now that you are 24, you are praying for God to have mercy on you. <laughs> when you were younger, they say, who are you? A prophet. I'm a pastor. I'm this. Now, every day you pray, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You have journeyed very far that your ordination has become obscure. You can no longer sense those whispers from Zion. You can no longer sense those burdens of God. Some of you were even as much as having visions when you were young. But now you don't know why. Even dreams, you can't dream anymore. And the few ones you have, in, once in three months, when you wake up, you forget it. You have traveled far. You are in a seclusion. Apart from God. The guy created a system of sufficiency apart from God. They started doing business so that when they have need, no need to pray. The guy had need, he would just go to the drawer and say, how much did he bring him again? You know, when you are working with Chevron, you will not have need for trusting God for food. Meanwhile, the reason God wants you to trust him for food is not because food is so important. It's because that point when you come to him, you make him feel himself as the El Shaddai. You know, when you worship God, you make him feel himself as Jehovah. 
When you rely on God, you make him feel himself as God. That's the beauty of worship. You know the 24 elders say, all things were created for their pleasure. So when you come to God and reveal your vulnerability, he feels himself. So the reason he will have you trust him and rely on him is not because he wants to put you in a tight corner. That is how he feels himself as God. He had obsession before he began to create the world. The Bible said, God is seeking those who will worship in spirit and in truth. So there are needs God has. Not need to make him God, but needs to derive pleasure and to enjoy himself and derive meaning from creation. But this guy had created a system that made him survive apart from God. That's why most times when you rely on your own, those days when we were serving, a friend of mine, the uncle was a very a big shot. In fact, they couldn't wait for him to pass out. The arrangement was that two weeks to pass him out. He was going to be given an appointment to work in Arik. That was around 211, 212. You know, these guys were still doing very well. He was supposed to be given the position of the deputy manager in Arik. This is a young man, a young ex copper without experience. You are giving him a managerial position because of the stature of his father. Two weeks to passing out, his father died. So the man who was supposed to give him the job now discovered he too has a nephew. Because the reason he was loyal was because the father was alive. You know, these guys then, they were big boys. Those days, especially in service, they would just drive in like, and then sometimes they would park the car, open the doors, and then they put extra speakers in the boot. So when they are playing the music in the car, it's like there's an event happening. And then they will sit on the car and be drinking and be having fun. They, you know, his, dest his future was already secured. Two weeks to passing out when his father died. He knew that the only way he will survive is for an invincible figure to appear from heaven. Because even the man that was supposed to sign the deal no longer picked his cause. <laughs> People you call and say, yeah, how are you doing? Now you call them, you see busy. You call busy, busy. It means your number has been blocked. So even if the man is not with the phone, when your phone, your call is coming in, the phone now has intelligence to block your line. So busy your call. If he knew God, if he knew God, maybe his intercession would have preserved his father's life until he passed out. Yes. Because your prayer can alter the scales of balances. <laughs> if he knew God, if he depended on God, it was possible for God to raise a thousand ways to make things happen for him. Because he said, it, the cat will upon a thousand hills is mine. He's not talking about cows. He's talking about many ways and possibilities for him to do what he wants to do. But only those who trust him can find those paths. Two weeks of passing out, the father died. So these guys created a system where they can survive apart from God. If God makes you a billionaire, if you are healthy, if your growth in the spirit is healthy, you will know that that money is meant for kingdom advancement. So it's a trust. Have you, do you know how they use trust fund? UNICEF. It's there so that if there's anything child related, education whatsoever, they can remove from that trust and meet the need. So the money with UNICEF is not their own. It's a trust fund. So when you grow in God and you have a kingdom mentality, you will know that everything God commits to your hand is a trust, including your beauty and your talent. But if God has not taught you where, or if you don't submit yourself to the tutelage of the Spirit, you will come to a point thinking that what you have makes you special. So when you come among other people, you want to show them that you are the best. The idea is not about best. Because there's no best in the kingdom. There's only spirit. And every one of us have the same spirit working with the same economy. So when you come, it's, a post, it's, it's just a privilege of service. That was the mentality, the erroneous mentality Lucifer had in heaven. You know, in heaven there was worship all the time. And because this guy was created to marshal and to control and regulate the affairs of worship, he felt he was more important than all the other angels. He was called the anointed cherub that covered it. So he was, his duty was to, was to cover the glory of God. He could discern the emotions of God. So when God wants to smile, he knows the sound to create, to saturate heaven so that smile can follow with decorum. If God wants to dance, the guy knows what to punch, to, 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 to press. You know, the Bible said from the day of thy creation, thy pipes and thy tablets were created in thee. So he was, he was, he regulated the music candles from himself. You don't need to labor like this keyboard pen. See the keyboard, the drum. There are two keyboards, my God. What a body. If 
Lucifer, if Lucifer did like this, he know the sound to create the whole heaven will be saturated with that sound. So worship in heaven was he controlled the decorum of worship. The Bible said, "Thou that seen the sun." The guy was so bright in glory that if he shows up, the sun go dim. That was the level of his brightness. That was why he was called the light bearer. If he shows up, the sun goes dim. He was coated with ten precious stones. The type that if you have one as an engagement ring, you will snap and go like this. This is not po this is not posture. This is telling the whole world the ring is an expensive ring. The guy was decked with diamond, was decked with sapphire, with cobalt, topaz, gold, all kinds of precious stones. So he felt he was special. He felt he was the best until iniquity was found in him, and that was when Michael was invoked. Suddenly he saw a guy stood like an armor tank. He didn't know the dimensions of Michael. It was Michael that resisted him out of heaven. He didn't know that Michael was the only angel called the Ark. The Ark angel. The word Ark means first in rank. <laughs> He's one of the chief princes in Zion. According to disposition in his operation in heaven, he is the first. He's called Michael, not an archangel, the archangel. Lucifer didn't know because the ministry of Michael was not invoked. That's why when you are on the plane, you are singing, you have a good voice, so you are, because you are the one leading the choir. When they are coming to sing, you, you compose yourself like this. And wait, let when others come up, you come and wait for the microphone. And then maybe the president or secretary makes a mistake and gives somebody else the mic. What? I am here. He didn't give me a mic. For the next two weeks, I'm not going for choir practice. The day you do that, you, in heaven, you are, you are delisted. So even when you carry the mic, it's talent that will be a meeting. The glory will not be transferred. Because you have separated yourself. And what makes the whole difference in the meeting is the supply of the spirit. If the supply of the spirit is removed, your ministration is useless. That's why I told you yesterday that oftentimes when worship is going on, our emotional cords are touched and then we are crying. We think something is happening. If God is really deposited in you, your life will begin to look like him. In the spirit, one of the things that is supposed to happen is that we behold him as he is. And they that behold him, they are changed. You come, you fall down. And then your life remains the way it is for the past five years. Brother, you are going worse and worse. What is happening to you is that your emotions are being filtered. There are some songs that make you, you know those days when we were not born again. Songs that sound sorrowful. Sometimes, when we want to, when we want to feel our soul, ourselves, we'll go and sit down. And then we'll sing the sorrowful song. And then we'll sing it slowly. And then sometimes we start crying. And then we'll feel good. There is no, it didn't strike a chord in the realms of the immortals. It didn't strike a chord. You only felt the euphoria because you were wired. You know, prophetic people like sorrowful sounds. Probably your DNA was pro a prophetic DNA. So you like sorrowful. Evangelists, they like power, power, gradual. So when they come there, for people who are prophetic, things that are sorrowful, he heightened their antenna in the spirit. The Holy Ghost have not come, so those possibilities were dormant. But because that's your configuration, you enjoy it. And then you come for the meeting. As the guy is singing that sorrowful song, you are now feeling as if God is touching you, something is happening. If God touch you, you will reflect God. So what you were enjoying was your emotion. You were just treating your emotion. If you hear another sorrowful song that is singing by Asa, we feel the same thing. If you hear another sorrowful song that is sung by a worldly person, powered by a demon, you will feel the same thing. That's why I told you spiritual transactions are not prosecuted on the frequency of emotion. The part of your soul that God does business with is the will. The will. The will is the deepest part of your soul. And the part of your soul that God reasons with is the mind of your spirit. Those are more important commodities. Your, your emotion is just to give flavor to your life. It's just like onions. They say, they say medically onions don't have any value. But it gives flavor. It gives flavor. If you live your life on the economy of emotion alone, you will feel yourself but you will move around one mountain for 10 years. It's when Christ is come that you discover you are not growing in God. You know that time when you came to sing. And then you cry, cry, cry. You feel that ah, you touch the third heaven. The day you have problem, maybe your brother is sick or somebody is dying and they call you. 
you will come and do then the person will be suffocating and dying that's when you realize all those things you were doing those days you were deceiving yourself he said if you faint in the day of trouble it means your strength is small some of us deceive ourselves until we come into trouble what makes you strong in God is to travel into him until you are clothed and that's why they think the devil will fight in your life is consecration. He wants to take you away. When you stand alone apart from God, you become vulnerable. Because these spirits, they have power. They have wisdom. They have intelligence. The devil and his whole heart, they were angels before they fell. And the devil, Satan, was one of the ranking angels in heaven. Those angels that are called archangels, they are first in rank. God gave them privileges in heaven. If you read Job 38 verse 7, he said when God created the foundations of the world, he said the sons of the morning sang for joy. They were the ones that imputed sound into everything God created. It's a privilege God gave them. So they have understanding. You cannot challenge the devil outside of the Holy Spirit. Everything you know, he has a data bank of your lineage. If he comes here now, if a familiar spirit comes here now, he can call the, the name of your tenth grandfather. He can tell you in your, in your bloodline, he can tell you what the last 10 generations in your family, they sinned, all of them committed. And then because he studied their life, he knows that you too, that will be your weakness. So go and check your family. Either all of you are weak to immorality or you are weak to lying or you are weak to pride or you are weak to drunkenness. These guys know. So when they want to tempt you, the devil will not waste his time tempting my brother Daniel the same way he will tempt me. If he wants to tempt Daniel, he'll go and check the profile of his family first. Maybe in his own family, lust is not an issue. So bring a naked woman here. He will be irritated. Ah, oh, this girl is so foolish. But in my own lineage, if lust is a challenge, if I will see a lady wear something short, I will check two times. Meanwhile, this one is being irritated. It's not the Holy Ghost walking over. That possibility is not in his DNA. And then my own family may be pride. His own may not be pride. So they bring two of us to minister. He comes to minister, the power of God moves, and then he, he doesn't see it as anything. For me, as I minister, then I'm going out, I begin to walk like this. Because the apostles to the nations have come. They are That's why the Bible says, no weapon fashioned against you shall prosper. The idea is that the weapon is fashioned. It is tailored and designed particularly for you. The arrow the devil shoots at you is not the same with mine. He knows your weaknesses. He knows mine. But your weaknesses are made up for in the Holy Spirit because one of the job description of the Spirit is that the Spirit himself helped our infirmities. So what the devil wants to do in the protocol of darkness is to separate you from the help of the Holy Spirit. So you come to a point where you even want to create a system where you live apart from God. That was what Juba invented. He created a job that made him to totally not depend on God anymore. He can live without the impute of God in his life. And then his brother, his brother created musical instruments. <laughs> you know the way you are wired, you are wired. There's a song in your spirit. Ah, I wish I was talking about the mystery of sound. I would have shown you the sevenfold dimension of sound. One of it is transport. One of the things sound does to you, sound helps you to transport and go to high places. If you have, if, if you are a science-oriented person. You will know that when electrons absorb energy, they go to a higher energy level. And when electrons lose energy, they descend to a lower energy level. There are two major things that conduct energy in the natural world. It's light and sound. That's why when the revelation hits your spirit, you jack up. You can hear some things and the realm of God becomes, you become more sensitive. You become more conscious. What that light did is that it caused an excitation to your spiritual senses. That's the same thing sound does. When you hear sounds from heaven, what happens is that the sound transports you to the realm of God. That is why sound is one of the precursors of intimacy in the realm of the spirit. You know, John was sentenced to the Isle of Patmos to die. When he was on that isle, something happened. He said, I was in the spirit. He was in the spirit, but he didn't travel. I was in the spirit on the last day. And then he said, I heard a sound as of a trumpet. The moment he heard that sound, something happened. He was catapulted to the realm of God. There is a sound weaved into your spirit. That sound is supposed to regulate your level of intimacy with God. As the sound grows, you discover that God becomes more real to you. You can almost embrace the Holy Spirit. It is one of the precursors of intimacy in the realm of God. The technique this guy brought was to create another sound apart from God. So that the sound on your inside will go down. So you can't sense God. You can't perceive God. You go and hear Selim Dion. Then you feel yourself. You lie down and relax. Or you hear any. Those are the kind of things he invented. To shut the sound of sounds that 
darkness is a civilization. It brings you to a point where God is no longer part of your ambience. You check your life, you exhale every part of your life. There is no area in your life where God has authority, including the way you dress. What you don't know is that you have journeyed on a path that is created by the wisdom of Satan. It's a path that takes you far away from God. These are the things Christians don't know. But sometimes when you come, you say, no, 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 don't hear this music, don't hear this music. They say, ah, is it a sin to hear this kind of music? No, it's not a sin, but it's a road in the spirit. And that road leads somewhere apart from God. You tell them, ah, they say something is trending. Something is now trending. All these, they are trending things. Somebody will go and say something in Big Brother Africa. A system that is pioneered by darkness. To, to, completely embellish you with lust in order to keep the memory of that 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 operation in your soul then the devil creates an utterance and then that utterance go viral then everybody is saying there was one they said the other time say what's his name now ZFP or somebody he said something i heard they said the, what was that thing he even said yeah, say logistics and then i started hearing logistics i said which one is logistics they say he's a winner of big brother is anything wrong with logistics? But every time you say based on logistics, the memory of Big Brother Africa descends back into your soul. What it's doing is that is to preserve that attitude of wardom, that system of wardom that was created is to keep it on your soul and it will remain fresh. And then as it's trending, you think it's just a trend. And then you are altering it, altering it, and then you pollute your soul. These things are intelligence. They are demonic intelligence. Tell people don't do this. They say, is it a sin? Is it a sin? No, it's not a sin. But it's a part in the darkness. The Bible said there's a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof is death, is destruction. And there is also a way that the Bible said there's a part that no foul know it. He said the virtuous eyes have not looked upon it, neither the webs of lions have walked therein. The end of that part, the Bible calls it wisdom. And in Job 28 verse 28, he said, what is that wisdom? He said, the fear of the Lord. This is wisdom. The knowledge of the Holy is the gateway to this kind of understanding. So they may not be seen, but they are roots. They are access portals into realms of darkness. What a civilization does is that it puts you on a path into darkness. And then you may look harmless, but it's a, it's a, it's a, a very delicate intelligence to beguile you. One of the 13 characteristics of sin is that sin beguiles. You walk on a slippery ground, you don't know you are going somewhere for your doom. You don't know when that song begins to create a desire to go clubbing. You don't know when you started clubbing. You don't know when they told you, eh, spin off is just a 7% alcohol now. Spin off is not very alcoholic. You just take one bottle. And then from spin off, you, you, you are now taking uh, spirit. You don't know when you now begin to dance on the club floor. The first day you came to the, the club, it was as if, I see what these girls are wearing. Jesus, Jesus. Tomorrow you become a kingpin. You are the one now mobilizing them. You don't know when from club, it begins to arrange girls for politicians. So you hear that this top shot is coming to town. So come on, girls. Come on, girls. And then you become a pin. A pin. But it started as if, these musics are not harmful. It's a root in the dark. That's what we call the civilization. It takes you far from God. And the point comes when all your spiritual senses are shut down. And then you assume new sets of senses. Those new sets of senses that are created in you are appetites. When those appetites are created in you, that's when you come under the government of darkness. You travel in civilization. You separate yourself to God. The impute of God is removed from you. And then you come to a place where you come under the real government of the devil. The devil cannot walk through you unless there are sets of appetite that give him an inroad into your life. Because those things are like masks. You can't have a network in the territory unless there's a mast. What spiritual civilization does is that it creates sets of appetite in you for different spirits to alight. Let me give you an instance. We don't have time anymore. You see, I'm trying to keep everything calm so that you can hear this thing, and while you are hearing, you are comparing it with your life. So that you find out where you are currently. I've discovered that most times we 
If what is operating in you is a, is a, is the ambience of God, a demon can't alight on you. So if a demon wants to alight on you, first of all, if he take you, and if God wants to alight on you, he draw you into His own ambience. That's what you call concentration. Are we together? Are we together? So when all of these things have been created, the devil is now ready to come in. And the inroads of the devil into your life are appetites. Let me show you something. You see, the Bible said something. He said, we have not received the spirit of this world, but we have received the spirit of Christ, where we know the things that are freely given to us by God. There are two things you need to know. First is that for the believer, the spirit that was given to him is the spirit of Christ. But you also need to know that apart from the spirit of Christ, there's another spirit called the spirit of the world. Secondly, it also reveals to you that what the Spirit of Christ does to you is to reveal to you the things that are yours in God. The other spirit that is not the Spirit of Christ, what it does to you is to reveal to you the things that are not of God. That's why if you have allowed that spirit to walk in your life for long, eh, you can just see a lady and then you become sexually aroused. Or you sit and then you touch a lady. Maybe you didn't even see it was a lady. You just touch her like this. And then it becomes sexually aroused. Or you just see money. And the moment you see money, your body begins to move. Ten, ten strategies of stealing that money have already downloaded. <laughs> and the moment the person step out, the money is gone. The money is gone. And there's not one way they will suspect you. What has happened is that those spirits have educated you on how to walk and gain mastery in their life and in their, in their operations. And the more you advance in that, the more God will become obscure to you. So you that just saw money now and you have the strategy of stealing it, they now come and tell you one simple spiritual thing. You can't understand it. You tell somebody something about God and then he comes and says, what do you mean by this one now? What do you mean by this one? What do you mean by this one? He can't understand how it works. See, Jesus told, they sent to Jesus and said, Lazarus is sick. Jesus said, the sickness is not unto death. And then they came to him again and said, Lazarus has died. He picked that one now in the spirit. And he said, Lazarus is dead. Let's go. Lazarus is asleep. Let's go and wake him. Uh -uh. Then the disciples say, ah, if he's asleep, he will wake up now. Somebody is sleeping. He said, no, wake up. He will wake up. You see, the Holy Spirit is not working in them. So at this point, it was difficult for them to perceive spiritual things. When the Holy Ghost begins to walk in you, eh, a point comes when if an angel passes, your eyes may not see it, all, but your spiritual senses have become a radar. You will just know that it's a being has passed. A being has passed. You can just sit and then something flashes and then instantly you know in the spirit that can. There's somebody here that dreamt three, three days ago and you saw a dead person. What the devil wants to do is to, is to draw you into a state of depression where he can attack you. All these things you are saying, when it dropped in your spirit, it was less than a picosecond. But your senses have been activated. You have come alive in the spirit. So little, little embers make big meanings to you. For Elijah, he saw something in the sky, like a fist of a hand, of a man's hand. He said there will be an abundance of rain. You know why? The spirit of God is at work in the man. But when the spirit of the world is at work in you, it becomes difficult for you to perceive the things of God. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 3, he said we have not received the spirit of this world. No. He said if our gospel be hid, is hid to them that are lost, in whom the spirit of this world are blinded, are blinded. So what it does is that it blinds you from the things of God. That's why it becomes difficult for you to understand spiritual things. But the thing is, the point I want to actually make is, how does this spirit alight on a man before he even begins to blind him? It's through act that time the devil is carrying you on a corridor of civilization of darkness. What he's doing is that he's creating different appetites in you for different spirit to rest upon. So a point comes when your heart becomes a ground for nurturing spirit of violence. It may begin as anger. Say, this is my anger. This is my anger. No, no. For me, at the best word, word. at the best word, word. Anger. After some time, you don't know when you hit somebody and the person have died. You have graduated. It's because it's spirit. The spirit of the world alights on your appetite. It was John that gave us the clearest perspective. In 1 John chapter 2 verse 14 and 15, he said, love not the world. He 
say they that love the world, they, they, the spirit of the father, the love of the father is not in them. He said, what is in the world? Is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. When those three appetites are created in you, you are already a candidate for the spirit of the world to dominate. The spirit of the world doesn't need to come and start struggling with you. The moment those appet appetites are created in you, you are already a servant of the spirit of the world. Anytime he wants to use you, all he needs to do is to stir those appetites. The lust of the flesh. And then you just see things, your heart go for them. And because your heart has gone, you begin to do things you don't do naturally. The lust of the eyes. That was what he brought to Jesus. You see, when Satan wanted to take over the life of Jesus, he didn't come fighting him and say, I am Satan. I am the God of this world. Become my servant. No, 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 no. It's a skillful, it's a skillful technique. Say, if you are the son of God, turn this to the bread. He was trying to explore the lust of the flesh. Because the Bible said, after Jesus has fasted for 40 days, he was afterward and hungered, and the tempter came. Jesus knew he was the son of God. The devil knew he was the son of God. So that's not the bone of contention. You don't try to, somebody comes to you now and says, if you are a human being, stand up. Uh -uh. Okay. That I'm a human being, there's no contention about it now. I know I'm a human being. I don't need to prove it to you. I'm a human being. Or somebody come and say, if I copper, go and wear your full uniform. And then you go and wear it. It's not a temptation now. You know you are a human being. The devil wanted to explore the lust of the flesh. Maybe it didn't occur to Jesus that ah, I don't need to travel back to the city to eat bread. I can actually turn stones to bread. So come on. He was exploring the fresh food of the appetites. And Jesus said, No, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That gate was locked. He now carried him to the pinnacle of the temple. He showed him the glory of the world. He said, bow to me, I will give it to you. You see that he has shown him something. So the lust of the eyes activated. You know, you don't know you needed that Brazilian wave or hair until you saw it on the other lady. And then when you saw it, the girl was doing like this. Ah! You see the Brazilian wave. You see it again. You see it again. And then when you went, you went now with a with an ambition to you too, you will get it. If you had not seen it, it wouldn't have been a problem. Now that you have seen it, the lust have been activated. So the devil, what the devil does is that he flashes you with things like this. He's trying to check the one that will move you. So if you come and he flashes something like this and it doesn't move you, say, okay, this one will be moved. He will drop it. You will carry another one from the shelf and flash it like this. That one didn't move you, drop it, you carry another one. The one that moved you, carry, then that one will stay there until you fall. Is a loss of the eyes. And then he, the last one he said he should jump from the pinnacle of the temple. The angels will bear him in his hand. He will not hurt his feet against a stone. That's the pride of life. He wants to show you you can do this. You can do this, yes. Then people are standing and they now call from Sister Bridget and they say Bridget usually does this and she can do it. God is not saying do it, but in order to save face. Even we who minister sometimes you will see that they have you come to a meeting and then you say, this is our cost too. Boom, 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 boom. And then that day the Holy Ghost say, keep it calm and show them truth. They say you are an apostle now. And people came and they, ah, is this the guy? Okay, let's see. The Holy Ghost say, keep it calm. You needed to show the people that you are a custodian of mysteries. So you want to and do things and carry out stuff. The Holy Ghost say, keep it calm. But if the pride of life is at work, even while you are standing on the pulpit, you can become a mass to host a spirit that is not the Holy Ghost. Because the moment an appetite is quickened, the spirit rests upon you. It's called the pride of life. That was why I told you yesterday, the person scoring me is in Zion. So I'm conscious of the one in Zion, not the one in the natural. I've gone for meetings before where he expected mighty things. And then it's as if the Holy Ghost put ice water on my chest. Say, no, don't fly today. I shook myself. I wanted to do. You know, when you are younger, you will struggle with these things. But when you have grown, then you will discover that it is the spirit that quickens. You can be called the man of utterance and then you come and talk and while the people, they are shouting, but no body, nobody will be convicted because it is the spirit that quickens. That day when he said, keep it calm, keep it calm, 
gate, lose your integrity before the people. Let them go and say, come on. And this guy, when I talk about like this, waiting, he carries them. No worry. It's a sign that you are gaining maturity in the spirit. You are killing the pride of life. So that the only spirit that can work in your constitution is the Holy Ghost. What was trying to instigate all of those things was the spirit because he wanted to enter. But that door is locked. You know, Jesus said, the fruits of this world come to me and find them. He explored all the appetites, but every gate was locked. That was why Jesus could not be infiltrated. The guy came and tried. He tried pride. He tried lust. All kinds of lust. No one was open. Then Jesus said, he came, but he found nothing. When the appetites are activated, then you become a mass to host those spirits. What concentration does for you is that it shuts down the appetites that are activated in you. In the process of preparation, a dangerous appetite will be created. You find out that different spirits are already working in your life. Some is lies. When you started lying, you thought you were lying because you were afraid that they would punish you. Now nobody can punish you again, but you are still lying. You want to stop, but you can't. You are now feeling I shouldn't. At first, you had a legitimate reason for lying. Because you were afraid that these people are wicked. They will punish you. Now there's nobody carrying cane to punish you. Why then are you still lying? An appetite that was created has hosted a new spirit. And you don't fight spirit with zeal. You don't stand up and say, no, the devil can't walk through me. It's not a function of resolutions. It's a function of consecration. Because when the spirit entered, it didn't enter with your zeal. It was a swift path that he navigated its way into your soul. The only way to shut it is to go back to the Holy Spirit, who is the author of all wisdom. He will teach you how to die to those appetites. Because when flesh is activated, the only thing you do with flesh is to kill it. The destiny of flesh is death. God doesn't do business with flesh. When a man is flesh, God doesn't come to manage it. Flesh is not managed. Flesh is killed. And you don't know how to die to flesh until the Holy Ghost begins to teach you. That was why Nicodemus came to Jesus at night. And he said, we know that thou art a teacher come from God. Because no man can do the things that thou doest except God be with him. You know, we are talking about being used of God. And Jesus began to educate Nicodemus. He said to be used of God is not just because God is with you. Because God is with you while you are with him. God is with every one of us. But the question is, why are we not being used of God? Jesus began to show Nicodemus a new path. There was a pathway you entered into that took you away from God. There is also another path you will enter into that will bring you back to God. Jesus said, except a man be born again. He cannot perceive the kingdom. There is a new kind of bet you must be exposed to. You know, they have taught us that being born again is just to accept Jesus as the Lord of your life. But what Jesus was telling us is that the moment you accept him as the Lord of your life, the first thing you collide with is a kingdom. A kingdom is a realm of dominion. It's a government. That government will begin to trust you. It will bring you to a place where it's not consistent with your appetite. You know, the Bible says when you were young, you went where you wanted. He said, but when you become old, you will be led by the hand. He's not talking about old age. When you were a babe in the things of God and you didn't have understanding, you felt like going to drink beer. You say, oh boy, this thing don't be seen. You felt like going for a club. Sometimes you even sneak so that people don't see you. The eyes that are seeing you, they are not in the visible world. The eyes that are seeing you are called a cloud of witnesses. They are sitting in the spirit realm and they are monitoring your life because the path that you are following, many of them travel there and they prove that God was faithful. That appetite you have, some of them had it, but they learned how to rely on God until he died. So Jesus said, when you go to heaven, don't think I'm the one that will condemn you. It is Moses. One of the things the cloud of witnesses do is that they prove to you that that condition you are in, they were there and God showed mercy. And because God is not a respecter of person, if you are there, he will show mercy to you. So you don't have any excuse to live perpetually in sin. There is help. There is an extension of the grace of God for everybody who is in a place where it's called the gate to bring him out. So Jesus said you must be born again. And when you are born again, the first thing is that you need to, the kingdom you begin to perceive, you need to yield to it. Nicodemus said, how can a man 
seen doctors. You have seen people die. You have taken malaria drug many times. The world system itself has educated you so much. You are an old man now. You are full of experiences of realities apart from God. How can this reality be accommodated? He said, how can a man be old and be born again? And Jesus said, that which is flesh is flesh. That which is spirit is spirit. He said, you must be born of water and of the spirit to be able to walk with God. What it means to be born of water, that's what we call baptism. What you did in the river or in the pool was the legal operation. It's just that one was a witness that you had decided to be initiated into the gate of baptism. After you enter that initiation, what you are saying now is that Holy Spirit, you have the authority to control and to regulate my life. It's an initiation process, bringing you under the dominion of the Holy Spirit. The moment you do that, the Holy Ghost now has the right to trouble you. It is after you are baptized in water that you begin to really ex experience what the meaning of baptism is. And the first thing it will do to you is that it will kill the flesh. Everything that you trust that is not God, begin to fail you. There will be a wisdom from heaven that makes all of those things to begin to fail you. Until you come to a point where you can no longer trust God. Then the spirit of God begins to bring suggestions to you. You say, why not try prayer? Why not try the word? Why not try fasting? That is when the spirit begins to bet you. It begins to suck you into his reality so that he begins to exchange your weaknesses for his own ability. If you begin to try prayer, for example, you will discover that it is the hardest thing for you to do. You will kneel down and you, you just want to live there. What the prayer is doing is fighting. It's fighting those appetites. It's choking those things that have constituted a mask for another spirit to align or light upon and to make you a slave. You will struggle with it, but the Holy Ghost will say, stay there. Stay there. Stay there. As you continue, a point come where you begin to enjoy prayer as if you are enjoying a movie. And then you go out, you discover that you that lied unconsciously, they ask you a question that threatened you. You didn't know when you spoke truth anymore. The same way you were lying unconsciously, you begin to say truth unconsciously. So it's not a function of resolution. It's a function of the supply of the spirit. When you submit to the spirit for long, what happens is that his essence is infused in you. That was the life Jesus came to mirror for us. You see, the Bible said Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. It's to show us how these possibilities are there. He came to John's baptism to be baptized. And John said, no, I should be baptized of you. He said, no, brother, suffer it to be so for now. Thus, it becometh for us to fulfill our righteousness. And he allowed John to baptize him, a creator being baptized by his own creation. According to the statutory system of heaven, it is as though it's an inconsistency. Because the Bible said, without every contradiction, the less is blessed from the greater. But this is the economy that the Father has put in place to show mankind how to walk and to come into the womb of the Spirit. It's the pathway of obedience. Suffer it to be so for now, for thus it becometh for us to fulfill our righteousness. And when he finished, the Bible said he was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He was not carried there to be coronated. He was carried there to be tempted. So you don't know why the Holy Ghost leads you to a place and say, say this thing. And then when you come boldly and say, God say this. And then the thing doesn't happen. What he's trying to do is to kill your pride. If it happens now, you go and say, yes, you know, we hear God. God speaks to us. So God carries you to a hospital and say, this man will not die. And then you say, maybe you even a spirit appeared to you and told you. And then when you went, the moment you lay hands on the man, the man now die. Next time when you want to lay hands on the sick, you will do it with reverence. Because you know it's not about you. It is the spirit that is walking through you. What he has done is that he has used that experience to destroy pride in you. Because pride is a vista that the spirit alights upon. When Jesus followed the Holy Spirit and concluded the days of fasting and passed the temptation of the devil, the Bible said he returned in the power of the spirit. The power that Jesus was walking with was not his power. It was the power of the Holy Ghost. That was when Jesus became a tool in the hands of God. Before he was 30 years, there were many cripples. He didn't go to any of them because the power of the Spirit had not been released. Service is not a function of zeal and ambition. Service is a function of the Holy Spirit walking through the man, the human vessel. He returned in the power of the Spirit and instantly the Bible said he was a shining light. He said the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Delta. The people that sat in darkness. This is a people that the devil have made a puppet. This is a people that the devil have separated from God and colonized to become part of his own entity. That enclave was.
was as if it was the domain of the devil. That was when Jesus that was shot into. And when he entered there, the Bible said, they that sat in darkness. A man of concentration had shown up. So when that man speaks, Zion backs him up. He said, they that sat in the shackles of death, behold, a great light is shown forth. That was the same experience of Philip. The Bible said, Philip went to Samaria. He preached Christ there and the city was full of joy. When you see a man has a large possibility in the spirit, it's not necessarily because the man is special. What you see walking through him is the degree of alignment. The extent of his yieldedness to the government of the Holy Spirit is the womb through the Holy Ghost breaks out. When you see a man speaks and things happen in the spirit, is the spirit breaking out of him. But before the spirit can break out of you, the window through which he breaks out must first of all be created by obedience. It's like God chiseling you until you become perfect. That is what the Bible meant when they say, if any man purges himself, he shall be meat for the master's use. Purging yourself is you align the sets of instructions that the Holy Ghost gives to you. And sometimes when the Holy Ghost wants to begin, he begins with you where he finds you. So for you, the Holy Ghost may say, don't eat for the next three days. Okay, just pass six to twelve. And then that day you woke up that you know the Holy Ghost said, don't eat. That's the day the hunk of three weeks will come that morning. It's as if if you don't eat before 8 o'clock, you will die. God is not interested in your starvation. God is trying to bring you under a new economy. It's an economy of obedience. As you begin to walk with him, then he begins to make himself strong in your life. Because when he becomes strong in you, he will be strong through you. You may come and say, okay, follow these people. Go for evangelism. But you want to sleep now. And then you say, I'm just traveling for 12 hours yesterday. I'm not sleeping. And they be, can you wait for two hours? The people say, no, we, we are not waiting. We are going now. The voice of the Holy Ghost says, go with them. Maybe the question you will answer in the interview that will give you that job is that part where he says you should follow that you will hear the answer. The answer is not part of everything you read in the university for five years. The answer is what you saw when you went for that rural organ. Somebody was just saying it and discussing it with somebody and you heard it. When you now go for the interview, they now ask, they are asking people questions. They ask, there are six of you. The first five people that they ask questions, you don't know anything, they ask them, so your mind is beating. <laughs> the one they asked the first person, you heard, you didn't know it. They asked the second person, you heard, you didn't know it. So when they came to the fourth and you didn't know it, just assume that I've heard this interview. Then when they came to you, they now ask you that question you heard when you were in the field, in the rural rugged. That's how the intelligence of the divine works. That thing you heard three years ago is what is going to be your salvation today. But you didn't know why God said, rise up and go. He was giving you the job that you are going to pray for three years later. He gave you that job three years before. A question that is not part of your profession. But you heard it in bitterness. And when you came, they now ask you. At that time, if I was the one, you adjust your tie. You say, well, um, then you begin to display your oratory power. The people who assume that, Kai, oh boy, this guy is vast. Oh. No, the guy is not vast. No, 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 he's not vast. He's in alignment. <laughs> There can be hundred interview questions. It's only one you know. The spirit can guide the interviewer. And that's the only one he will pick. If they ask you the second question, the third, the fourth, you will fail all of them. But when you are guided by the powers of alignment, the only one you know is the one you will be asked. Because when the Holy Ghost was chiseling you, you decided to yield to the instructions of God. So people will look at you and think you are invincible. Ah, why everything they want for this guy? You come to speak. And then people are talking to you. And then the Holy Ghost just funny something in your mind. And then you, you say it with humility and fear. And they say, ah, how did you know the answer? Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> you didn't come there because you are past. Sometimes when you begin to talk, they say, oh boy, this guy is a wise man, a wise man. Yeah, they are correct. Because wisdom is actually not a product of mental exertion. Wisdom is actually your ability to gaze into the spirit and to receive inspiration from the spirit. They are the ones that created the world. The people that are called wise men in the spirit were men in the scriptures. Were men that can look into the spirit and bring results. So when the king is in trouble, he doesn't go as far as go for the wise men. They can gaze into the spirit and tell you, ah, 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 this will happen, this will happen, this will happen. It doesn't conform with natural patterns, but that thing will happen because they have seen from the realm of reality. What makes a man invincible is his obedience. As you obey the Holy Spirit, 
used to I used to like this kind of music. Now you are traveling in a bus for two hours. The driver is playing it on a loud volume. You didn't even hear it. It's when you came down that you now discovered ah music was playing in that bus. What is happening is that the music that is playing on your inside is louder than you. The technology of Jabba no longer works with you. You are fused back to a new economy. You have become an invisible man. One of the things that the powers of obedience does is that it kills appetites. And by doing it, you purge yourself. You purge yourself. Eight years ago, we were still young. The things of God, we were still walking with zeal and doing all kinds of things. Okay, nine years ago, that was two children. When my mom died, I said, I'm a man of prayer. How can it happen? I told somebody, I said, I've been feasting. My guy, forget it. I didn't know that word I spoke had opened a gate in my soul. It was an opening. The spirit entered. And in one year, in one year, I became a man of a green bottle. The only thing that provided support for my soul was a bottle of star. The appetite was never there. How it was created, I didn't know. But when God wants to help a man, what he does is that he begins to bring protocols of obedience into your life. When those obedience are completed, then you begin to avenge other disobedience. The day the Lord began to encounter me, I still had a crate of cancer in the fridge. I was not, I was not disciple to stop. I was not counseled. The appetite I died. I woke up and I discovered the taste of star and now abhorred it. Because a new order of appetite was being created as the Holy Ghost was seeping through my vessel. Some of you may be a slave in immorality. You can't even tell your best friend. Because even you, you are ashamed of it. You have asked God in the secret place to help you. You have cried. It's not everything that is answered by prayer. Certain things are answered by chiseling. By chiseling. As you obey the Holy Spirit, what happens is that that gate is shut. And then you will now discover that happened. So this thing was not... Have you not noticed? A man will see every gear and he's lost in over half. But he will lie down in the room with his sister and he doesn't feel anything. So the idea is not because the person is a girl. It's a set of philosophies and the empowerment of spirits. You can be in the house, your sisters wear boxers and very skimpy singlets. You don't even notice they are there. Meanwhile, you just come to a place because a lady shows up, you are distracted. Both of them are women. They have the same things. But what is working on your inside is different. When the Holy Ghost begins to help you, every other girl you see becomes a sister. Before you even get married, the Holy Ghost will have to show you. Everybody becomes a sister. Why? Because that possibility the devil wants to manipulate has shut down. It is the power of obedience. Most Christians don't know it. We live our lives in a freelance way. We do what we choose to do and we think God can be strong through us. It doesn't work like that. Jesus said, except a man is born of water and of the spirit. Except a man dies to flesh. Apostle Aaron taught us. He said there are five things you die to in life. The first one is sin. That one happened in Christ. The second one is judgment. It happened in Christ. The third one is Satan. It happened in Christ. The fourth one is Hades. It happened in Christ. He said, but the fifth one is flesh. You don't die to flesh in Christ. You die to it as a living sacrifice. So you'll be alive when God is cutting it. It will pain you, but it will will continue and God will get you to heal yourself until he cuts it off. If you can wait until God cut it off, then you appear and you become a solution to your generation. Consecration is one thing you must follow until it's complete. Else, it will be a half-baked bread. Billy Akani told the story. He said, the problem with the egg when the chick sits on it is that it must be complete. The process must be complete. If the process is not complete and by any means the chick leaves that egg, because of the number of days the chick have already seated or sat on the egg, the egg is no longer an egg. It's already becoming a what's the name for a small fowl? Okay, let's use a chick in a chick, right? A chick is becoming a chick already. The process of becoming a chick has begun. So if the if the, the mother hen that sat on the egg leaves without completing it, the egg will not be an egg and it will not be a chick the egg will be wasted. So in consecration, you have to wait until God finishes on you. And if God doesn't finish with you, God can't send you. The Bible said, he called them to be with him that he may send them. The crisis we have in the body of Christ today is because babes are on the altar making loud voices. They are talking without understanding, having no authority to back the things they say. 
do himself and begin to give you the skill and the tools of ministry. It's after God equips you that he sends you to the world. There are two things that you will find in the life of anybody that he sent. One, he must know the location where God sent him. And two, he must know his mandate. John said, I am the voice of the one crying in the wilderness. He went straight to Jordan he remained there. You go and check the life of the men that are made exploits. It's not this one that stand up and say, we are God's Army Revivalist International Network of Nigeria. You say, what is your call? The top one that looks like Pastor Sebastian and top one that looks like Living Faith. Those are not the things we are talking about. If God has not sat on you to consecrate you, He will not send you. You can go about and give yourself any title. You will be a, a, a challenge and a threat to the body of Christ. Consecration is one of the heaviest molecules in this kingdom. And for you to be a vessel that God will use, you must allow the sequence of consecration to be complete in your life. business in the spirit. Very quick, very quick, very quick business. We don't have time. It doesn't take God eternity to do that which is eternal. And not everything is communicated cognitively. There are certain things that are transmitted as a body of spirit. There is a dimension of the spirit that you can never learn no matter how theologically accurate you are. It takes the spirit of revelation to bring you into the reality of those dimensions. When you lift your hands toward heaven right now and ask for a fresh, a fresh ministration of the spirit. Most of you have been educated in the things of the spirit. Most of you have studied a lot of things but it's beyond the powers of theological intelligence. It has to do with the supply of the spirit. And even though we do not have time tonight, all we need is an impartation of the Spirit, the impartation of the life of God. If you can let contact to the Spirit that is eternal, everything that is in God can be communicated in a second. It's a supply of the Spirit. It's a supply of the Spirit. It's a supply of the Spirit. In the supply of the Spirit. Come on, go ahead and ask for an impartation of the Spirit to work. Shall I not 
Tonight, the hand of God wants to recruit people that will stand in the gap for others in the place of intercession. It's not a meeting for everybody. As I speak to you now, as I speak to you now, there are a few young ladies that the Lord wants to anoint now. You don't need to do anything. Don't keep on the beat. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to get emotional. It is an eternal ordination. It's an eternal ordination. It's going to bring into your spirit an energy to carry, to stay in resilience in the place of prayer. Because this one shall be priestesses that will stand as watchers over family heritages. Stand as watchers to preserve the heritage and the dominion of God in their families and in their territories. The people I speak about, they are aware. Because most of you have been having strange encounters in the last three months. Strange encounters. Strange encounters. Some of you have been having intense hunger for the presence of God. But you don't know how to go about it. There's about to be a wind of the Spirit. And so, precious Spirit of the living God, from the left hand side, to the right hand side, from the front to the back, Holy Spirit, begin to anoint us. From the left to the right, from the front to the back, we are the intercessors. We are the intercessors. Wherever they are, find them, Holy Ghost. Find them, Holy Ghost. Find them, Holy Ghost. Let there be activations right now. Activations right now. Touch. Shabbat Tetenia. Hey. Come on, let's see. Didi kata tatiya. Eli didi kata da. Shura pate. Predetini sko predetali. Eli la ne kasi didi kata tida. Hey ya, hey ya, hey ya. Imra ne te kasi zuzuza. Paratini sko predetali. Manti kasta pate skipo ronda koria. Eli da 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 tia, da 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 tia, da 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 tia. Marido sko predetali. Hey. Hey! 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 The waters of heaven! The waters of heaven! The time has come! The hour of ordination has come! Let the oil rest! Let the oil rest! The waters of heaven! Oh my God! Somebody's right hand is being anointed with power! Somebody's right hand is being anointed with power! With power! With power! With power, with power, this one is a judge in the spirit. This one is a judge in the spirit. Holy Spirit of God, Yabo Rekatiria, Ombraska Tetetelis. Hey, 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 hey! The weight of glory is coming upon somebody's chest. A weight of glory, a weight of glory, a weight of glory. You are about to carry the glory of the Lord, the glory, the glory. The glory realm, the glory realm of the anointing, the glory realm of the anointing is descending on somebody like a weight. It's like a weight. Catch it now. Catch it now. Catch it now. Catch it now. If a tatari na tay, is ziri ni kita vali kapanda na de. If is a zobe tatali, arina na tay balu tatali kapa. Is ziri is zira tadi ya tatay. Eliki baga baga bono, eriada teko, e pretina suzu na patai. Hey hey hey! Ome lele tete bebo sate. Ila da di da di da 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 da. Eli na di 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 da di na di 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 na di na. Eli li 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 la li. Ela la 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 la. Ila ni na ni la de. Ata di da di na di na di na. Ori da 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 bebo la de. Eli da di a da di da di da de. Ala da da di na de. Oba la 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 la. Ela di ni ni da da. Ela di ni ni da da. Ra da di da de 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 di na de. Ili da de de. Pray 
your hands toward heaven. Lift your hands toward heaven. Just be still for a moment. Be still for a moment. Be still for a moment. Those who are on their knees, you don't need to rise. Just be still. At any point you are, any, any posture you will sustain, so long as the Lord can talk to you, it's, it's okay. Just ask the Lord to speak a word to your heart now. Most of you have wondered whether God speaks to people now. You are not even sure whether it's real. You've never had an experience with God. I want the Lord to touch somebody now tangibly. To break doubt forever from your life. Forever. Somebody is about to hear the audible voice of the Holy Spirit. The audible voice of the Holy Spirit. It will break doubt forever. Precious Holy Spirit. Precious Holy Spirit. Right now, Lord, I ask that you whisper to their hearts. That whisper from eternity that brings men to a spot of perfect conviction of your reality and your essence. That ends every doubt and every argument. Lord, speak to them now. Speak to them now, Lord. Let the weight of doubt dissolve forever. 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 Lord, speak to them now. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, precious Holy Spirit. Somebody is about to hear an audible voice on your left ear. An audible voice, as if somebody just spoke to you. Yes, Lord Jesus, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Breathe upon us, Lord, and speak to them. Audibly. Let the left ear open to hear the voice of the Spirit. Now, in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. It's done. Yes, Lord. We give you praise. We give you honor. We give you glory. In Jesus' precious name. Look at me. Who is that person that helped God? Just wait. You don't need to step forward. Who is the person? Can I say correct? No, you are here of God. You are here of God. You heard God. Just wave your hand. Let me see you quickly. I needed somebody to hear God audibly. Is there anybody on this left row? Is there anybody in this middle row? You heard the Holy Spirit. Anybody here? You heard God. Somebody should have heard God now. Is there anybody? It can't be you. It can't. 
it can't be you. It shouldn't be you. You hear God virtually at will. Okay, everybody stand up. Those kneeling down, maybe they are still under the, the influence of the Holy Spirit. I have just a 25 minutes teaching to do. And then do a little impartation for 5 minutes. And then we'll be out of here. Is everybody up? Those who are born in the Spirit. Anybody under the yoke of the Holy Spirit? All the burdened people. Okay, everybody's up now. You heard God on this road. Can I see you? Somebody have heard God. I sense that energy. And it cannot, it should not be revealed. Anybody on this road heard God? Did anybody on this road heard God? Okay, this lady, you heard God? Is the power of God so strong on you? Okay. She can't stand. Alright, when we are done, we'll hear what you heard from the Lord. Since obviously you cannot, it's difficult for you to stand. God bless you. Be seated. Let me talk to you for 25 minutes. And then we'll pray. The devil has fought this meeting. I pray that the Lord will do what he wants to do tonight. I was here on Wednesday. We had all kinds of issues and um, it became literally impossible for me to share the word of God. I left. We came today only to find the multitude outside. And I was told some secular organization at the hall. Don't know what they were doing. But um, the little time we have, I believe the Lord will do something tangible in your life that will transform you forever. You see, we are not lecturers. We are not lecturers. When we share the word of the Lord, the spirit that furnishes us with the inspiration is transferred. So primarily, our objective is not necessarily to educate you, even though you will be educated in the course of the ministration. Our objective thank you, is to ensure a transference of spirits because that's the only thing that sustains the capacity to alter your life for good in the operation of spirits they are not so they are not so interested in you knowing about them they are not so interested in you knowing about their operations spirits have an ambition and the ambition of spirits is to colonize your territory, your world, and your realm. So that that which they have in mind, your life will become the channel and the gate through which they can express the things they have in mind. The desire of spirits is to dominate the visible creation. But unfortunately, according to the strategic design of this realm, spirits don't sustain the legality to function in this realm. It's just like you are living... Most of you who are students and you are supposed to spend four years in Uniagri, you are now told everything you need to say, it's your friend that will say it on your behalf. Do you know how frustrating it will be like? When you want to laugh, it's your friend that will laugh on your behalf. When you want to smile, it's your friend that will smile on your behalf. When you want to talk, it's your friend that will talk on your behalf. Everything you want to do, your expressions, the totality of your expression. We only be trafficked through that your friend that will walk with you at every time. You will now discover that relationship with that your friend is indispensable. Because if you will live your life, then that your friend must be the only channel through which your life can find expression. That is this condition that spirits have found themselves. Their greatest desire is to find expression in this visible creation. But the visible creation is separated from their dimension. And the only gate and channel through which they can find manifestation in this realm is through the vessel of human vessel, of, of mortals. That is why spirits are concerned about you. That is why spirits speak to you. That is why spirits communicate to you. The idea is not just to educate you. The idea is to get you become 
a conductor of their realities. So when God is dealing with you, He's not primarily interested in educating you. That's why most of you take pride in knowing so much about God. It does not strike a chord in eternity. Knowing so much about God does not make you relevant in heaven. What will make you relevant with God and in eternity is the degree to which your life becomes a channel through which God is able to manifest His will and His purpose. And that is the definition of life. Unfortunately, not many persons are living like that. And it is for this wise that the doctrine of the Holy Spirit becomes very important. Because God can only be known and experienced by the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, it is impossible for God to be known. It is possible, impossible for God to be contained. And it is impossible for God to be expressed. So as difficult as it is, the Holy Spirit must have to be known and your life must have to become one with the Holy Spirit. Because like I said, the desire of spirit is for their reality to be manifested. If God will be manifested in this world today, then somebody must be the channel through which God will be manifested. And even if you are available as a vessel, if you don't know the Holy Spirit, your yieldedness will be a waste. Your knowledge about God will be a waste. The Holy Spirit is the only means by which the essence of God can be experienced and communicated. And that is why the Holy Spirit becomes the most important personality in all of the realms of God. Are you with me? There are many of you that are students of the Bible. You read the Bible. And some of you take so much pride in quoting scriptures. But quoting scriptures will not change your world. Everything you do, everything you say, no matter how spiritual it is, the power it has to make any change in this world is the measure of the spirit that you can traffic. There are few people on earth that are trafficking spirits. Very few people. There are many talkers, many preachers, but very few are trafficking the spirit of God. When you see the world plunging into darkness, it is because men have become perfect conductors of demonic entities. Why they have become insulators of the dimensions of God because they don't know the Holy Spirit. You may think it's about an elaborate syllabus. Spirit don't need a syllabus. What they need is to get you and to walk through you. Have you looked at your campus in recent times? Have you noticed that some people are very intelligent, hardcore prostitutes? Where did they receive the lectures from? They have only been in relationship with demonic spirits. Have you looked at your campuses? Some have become terrible courtists. Back in the days when we were here, around 2008 to 2010-11, we had boys that were executioners. With four years on campus, some of them have killed over 25 persons. Where did they learn it from? They were in league with spirits. They were never trained in the art of killing. None of them were in the military. None of them were trained anywhere. But they had intelligence communicative intelligence with spirits that have to do with death. So their life became an extension of spirit. You may call yourself a Christian and you may pride in it. But if God is not traveling through your life to affect you and your family, what you are calling is a title, is a waste. It does not have a relevance where it counts. Most of us are in church but we are agents of darkness. Because our life is a conduction of the multifaceted dimension of the demonic realm. Have you noticed that demons manifest through our dress? They manifest through our world. Where are we taught those things? Because it is the intelligence of spirits to possess humankind and to traffic their dimensions through them. God is in need of invading Uniagri. But the question is, where are the vessels? Fellowships everywhere. Multitudes of people parading different churches. But our world is poor. Where are the vessels? There are few that know the Holy Spirit. The knowledge of the Holy Spirit is the most significant knowledge we ever have in this life. I speak of knowledge. I'm not thinking about medical knowledge. I'm not thinking about talking about cerebral intelligence. I'm talking about experiential, intimate knowledge of a person. The Holy Spirit. Most of you take it for granted because you have a hope. That when you graduate from school, 
You are doing very well in your academics. And life will be better. Some of you have confidence in uncles and relatives. So you think it's about ex excelling in life. There is no success in this life. Except as your life becomes a gateway through which God can be known. Because at the end of it, most of you may die at your prime. Most of you may die at your old age. It doesn't even matter when you die. The most important thing is, did your life translate to an impact on earth? God can give you a 300 years. It will be 300 years of more pain in hell. Because the longer some of you live, if you don't know the Holy Spirit, you will cause many others to go into sin. Have you checked your life in recent times? How many persons have you impacted positively? It is a revelation of the kind of spirit that is a master over your life. Today we need to come to an understanding of the knowledge of the Holy Spirit. Many say they are preachers, but they don't know the Holy Spirit. So which God can they witness? Which God's dimension can they traffic? We have many people talking in arrogance, but our world is not changing. What is the challenge? There is a problem in our relationship with the Holy Spirit. And the problem is the problem of the ignorance of the blessing of the Holy Spirit. Many don't know Him. You may talk about Him. You may do a theological exegesis about Him. But it doesn't mean you know Him. Because knowing a spirit is an experience. The knowledge of a spirit is an experience. It's not a theological knowledge. It's an experience. Who is the Holy Spirit? And why is He so important? Jesus, the Son of God, He came from heaven. His body was given to him, was prepared for him. His spirit is the spirit of God. Everything about Jesus came directly from heaven. But Jesus had no life except as he lived by the Holy Spirit. If you looked at the life of Jesus, the summary of Jesus' life is total dependence on the Holy Spirit. From his birth to his resurrection. Every aspect of your life that is independent of the Holy Spirit will not be numbered in eternity because it will not be seen. It will not be reckoned with. It will not have a relevance in God and it will not even be known. That aspect of you will look as if it didn't exist. Have you watched the movie before? And then maybe when the movie was taking place, as they were recording the movie, they now cut some part of it. You will watch the movie and then it will jump. Or you are listening to a message because there was an issue. Then you are hearing the preacher saying something and then they cut it and cut it. And then you just go to the end of the message. Because that part was removed. That is what your life will look like without the Holy Spirit. Every aspect of your life that the Holy Ghost is not completely in charge of, it will be edited out. It will not appear in eternity because God can't see it. The Holy Spirit is the only means through which God can make reference to you. Did you not notice that even when Jesus completed his perfect sacrifice, a sacrifice satisfied the claims of divine justice, but there was no way God could see it. So the Bible said in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 14 that he was offered up by the eternal spirit. Unless that sacrifice was uttered in the Holy Spirit, God could not see it, even though it was perfect. Any life that is void of the Holy Spirit is a life that never existed. The Bible said in the book of Matthew chapter 1 verse 18 to 20, he said, Mary was found with child of the Holy Ghost. So the conception of Jesus was what? Of the Holy Ghost. That means as powerful as God was, it was impossible for Jesus to come into this world except as the Holy Ghost conceived him. The Bible said in Luke chapter 1 verse 35, it said the Spirit of the Lord will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. And that thing that will be formed in you will be called the Son of the Highest. So the Son of God could not come into this world as powerful as God was except the Holy Ghost was the one that trafficked him into this realm. The whole ministry of Jesus Christ was by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, the works that I do, the Father that is in me is the one that did it. Everywhere Jesus went to, he was led and inspired by the Holy Ghost. In Matthew chapter 4 verse 1, Luke chapter 4 verse 1, the Bible said, he was led, he was led into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. When was the last time you did something because the Holy Ghost inspired you? You have become so intelligent. Meanwhile, it is written that it is not given to man that walketh to order his steps. Because everything you do, no matter how intelligent it looks like, is foolishness. Because you can be a manipulated species in the hand of a spirit. Jesus, he was the son of God. He created all things. The Bible said, all things were made by him. Without him was not anything that, that was made that was made. Meanwhile, when Jesus came into this world, he still had to be 
led by the Holy Spirit. It's just like you coming to your homeroom. The parlor you dressed, the bedroom you set, you needed to depend on God to lead you. That was the kind of life Jesus lived. He created this world. But he understood that life has no relevance apart from the Holy Spirit. So he submitted himself to the Holy Ghost. He was led by the Spirit of God. Have you not noticed why many things don't work? Some of the decisions you have taken in the last five years are dislocated decisions. You are supposed to be in Makodi, but you have found yourself in Congo and then you are seeking the will of God. Before that thing happened, the Holy Ghost have to. How many of you have read, you have entered these vehicles that have navigators? Navigators. You know, when you, <laughs> when you enter a vehicle that has a navigator, you can program your journey. As you are going, if you violate the direction that you are supposed to follow to get to that journey, the navigator will begin to alert you that you are taking the wrong route. You are taking the wrong route. What the navigator will do is that it will begin to recalculate for you. Shortest means you will follow to get to your destination again. Because you have violated the program pathway that you should go. Jesus knew that every step he needed to take was already programmed in the Holy Spirit. So he followed the Holy Spirit. Some of us have made wrong decisions. The last five years of our life, we were going in the wrong direction. For us to get back to destination now, the Holy Ghost has to renavigate. And that renavigation may take you three months of fasting. That renavigation may take you six months of prayer before you find the bearing to return back to where the Holy Ghost is to carry you in order to enter into your destiny. You need to be renavigated. Jesus had this perfect understanding. When you look at the life of Jesus, He didn't do the things He did because He was the Son of God. If Jesus did what He did because He was the Son of God, God would have been on it. When Jesus came into this world, He had to be exactly like you and I in order to satisfy the claims of divine justice. So Jesus depended on the Holy Spirit completely to do the things He did. And that is why Jesus tells you that you can do the same thing that He does. And how did He do it? By relying on the Holy Spirit. If your life is not being directed by the Holy Spirit, how do you ever imagine you are going to satisfy the will of God? He said he was led of the Spirit. He was led of the Spirit. Even the mighty works that Jesus did was by the Holy Spirit. The Bible said how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and with power. Some of us want to walk in power. We are going to read books. You want to read the secret of the healing anointing. You will know the secret. You will climb all the scriptures, but you will see nothing. Because it is the power of the Holy Spirit that makes it happen. The Bible said when Jesus returned in Luke chapter 4 verse 14. He said he returned in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Luke chapter 4 verse 18. He said the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me. He has anointed me to heal the sick. To set that liberty to them that are bruised. To heal the broken hearted. So he knew that it was the Holy Spirit working. Especially for we this young generation. You know, we can be very arrogant. When you know one or two secrets, then you become a preacher on Facebook. You know, Facebook is an easy platform. If you have data, you can become an apostle on Facebook. Have you noticed that in recent times? There are many evangelists on Facebook. Many Facebook evangelists. Without the investment of the Holy Spirit. He said everything he did was by the Holy Ghost. If Jesus depended on the Holy Ghost like that, who are you? Have you thought about it? The reason you come is because you don't see the need to depend on the Holy Spirit. So when you go to pray, you have other plans. Have you not noticed that when there is a crisis that you don't have any way out? That day you pray for five hours. You don't notice time is going. But every other time you have a way out. That's when you go to pray and say, Ah, Jesus. Thank you for your love. Yeah, Holy Spirit. Ah. You have been chasing for 5 hours. It's around 11.30 p.m. When you finish that movie. That you wanted to sleep. You now come and say. Lord I love you. I honor you. Thank you for the gift of life. Thank you for everything. What is everything? <laughs> Thank you Lord for everything. And then you doze off. You don't see the need to depend on the Holy Spirit. Jesus will leave a crusade. And he will go to the mountain. And pray till morning. Because he knows if he doesn't receive the whisper for the next day, he is lost. And according to the writing of the prophets, everything that was written concerning him must be fulfilled. Everything must be fulfilled. And they didn't tell him when he was coming. 
he needed to depend on the Holy Ghost to hear it. If you are told you cannot go out of the room tomorrow, unless you hear where God will tell you to go to, you will pray all through the night. But you don't know the meaning of life. You don't know the weight, the demands of God concerning your life. Most of you have no idea what God planned concerning you. Because you came from a poor family, you think it's all about poverty. So you judge your father. Your father has one bicycle. Your ambition is to have a bike. You people, you, have, you rented three bedroom flats. So you are hoping you will build your own house. So your big ambition in life is to build a house. You don't have an idea. There are some of you here today who are still attending clubs. The nation of Brazil, the future of Brazil is in your hand. But you don't have an idea. You don't know what God is thinking. Most of you, the Senate, in the next five years, the decision that will change this country is resting in your hand. But you don't have an idea. Jesus knew when he came into this world that his destiny was to save mankind. So there was no time for jokes. Somebody said Jesus is a very humorous person. But he never cracked one joke all his life. At least it was not recorded in the Bible. You don't know what God is expecting of you. Sometimes you need to pray for God to grant you access to see into the spirit and know what God thinks concerning your life. You who is begging for bread, begging for direction every day, if God helped you, then you will discover that there will be no Nigeria tomorrow unless you rise. You, think you don't have an idea. Jesus knew the life of men depended on him. There were days when he will pray all through the night and then he will minister the evening. And then he will go praying again till early in the morning. And he will join the apostles. He will go to the other side of the river. He will heal the madman. They will send him back. He will go for another crusade and go back. Because he knew he can't take a step unless the Holy Ghost speaks. Have you come to that point when you know you don't have the right to move unless God speaks? You don't have the right. The Bible said, it's not given to man that walketh to order his step. It's not given to you. Every time you move apart from the voice of God, you have erred. And that step you take, you may never recover from it again. No matter the intervention of God. You don't understand the heavy matters of the kingdom. You think your life is all about getting a good job. So God raised you to get a good job. How about the people who, who, who are going to employ you who don't know God? Most of you, we are, your biggest breakthrough in life will be to work for Dangote. Dangote is not a Christian. He doesn't know God. So who told you the goal of God is to be so gracious to you so that you have a good job? The man who is giving you that job don't know God. He should tell you there is something about your life that is deeper than your job. How that, what will you make your ambition? Ambition in life is to get a good job. It's a waste of a life. And most of the time because we are not well instructed. Jesus had a better understanding. The Bible said in the volume of the books it is written concerning me. I come to do thy will, O God. And that will, he doesn't know it in his head. He depended on the Holy Spirit to tell him every day. So the Bible said he was led of the Spirit. He was led. That's how important the Holy Ghost is. Even when he died, Jesus walked by eternal life. He walked by faith. He walked by the Holy Spirit. And he walked with the assistance of the angelic realm. But the, a time came when eternal life did not walk. A time came when faith did not walk. A time came when the angelic did not walk. He had to let go of all of those things. Because for him to fulfill the mandate of Zion, he had to die. So when he died and all the economy that powered him failed, the only thing that came through was the Holy Spirit. Jesus knew that when everything fails, the only thing you can bank on is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said he was raised back to life by the glory of the Father. In Romans chapter 6 verse 4. He had understanding. Have you come to that point in your life where you know there's nothing, you can't be anything apart from the Holy Spirit. You can't be anything. It doesn't matter if your father is the president. I keep telling this story. We were serving in 2012. A friend of mine, his father was a director with Eric. He had already concluded the whole paper. That the moment we pass out for NYC, a guy will become a, senior, a deputy manager in Eric. Around 2012, he would have been a big boy. These were guys that during the service day, they were driving very heavy cars. Heavy cars. They don't know whether they are paying NYC and Lawi. What do they have to do in 1980? What is 1980? They spend money every night. Money. They spend money. These are guys that go out, they carry 100,000 as coppers. They don't know anything about their Lawi. 
his life was made. He was just waiting to pass out. NYC was a waste of time. Two weeks to passing out, his father died. Two weeks. The father died. All the father's friends that would call him and check up on him, none of them were picking his calls again. Because what created their relationship with him was no more. And they owe him no allegiance. The Bible says, Woe unto the man that put his trust in the arm of flesh. Most of us, our confidence is in men. And that is why we treat God with levity, with disdain and with reproach. If you know your life depends on the Holy Spirit, you begin to live like Jesus Christ. He didn't step out of his house unless he had come. That's how to live. The compass of life is the voice of God. You don't move unless God speaks. How many of you live like that? You say you are a Christian. You think Christianity is a title. Christianity is life in the spirit. It's called life in the spirit. Many of us are called Christian, but we don't know the ABCs of Christianity. We have not started being Christians. We just know what is called, and we are called because we are born into Christian homes. Christianity is life in the spirit. Even when your life fails and nothing works, even when your faith fails, you know there is a being called the Holy Ghost. That's why it's so important to know Him. Even the very teachings of Jesus, the Bible said, Jesus said in Luke 4, 18, He said, the Holy Ghost have anointed me to preach the gospel. I thought He was the Word of God. The Bible said in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God and the Word was God. He said the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him and there was not anything that was made that was made except by Him. He was the Word. He didn't need any to share the Word of God. But He understood that the Word of God would be dead except as it is empowered by the Holy Ghost. So when He spake, He said the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. They are spirit and they are life. In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 2 He said when he gave commandment to the apostles By the Holy Spirit By the Holy Spirit That was the man that understood And knew who the Holy Ghost was If your life is not centered around the Holy Ghost You don't know him yet Forget all this nonsense that people are arguing about speaking in tongues Is this, are we supposed to speak in tongues? Uh, we are not supposed to speak in tongues You don't know the Holy Spirit You don't even know the Holy Ghost You are talking about engaging him if your life does, is not built on the Holy Spirit, you don't have the right to argue about tongues or no tongues. Because you don't even know the one you are talking about. So what is the use of tongues? Some of us, our prayer has no difference with the Muslim man. Because when we are praying, we don't even have confidence in anything. What is the difference between your prayer and the prayer of the house of man? It is the Holy Spirit. And you don't know Him. Who is the Holy Ghost? I, I wish. You know, there are some topics that... Um, they are not meant for 50 minutes meeting. Because even the background, you can't create the background to enter the topic. You can't create the background. The summary of your life is called the outworking of the Spirit. The degree to which God is manifested through you is the summary of your life. It's not the number of years you lived, or the haircut, or the good looks. Those are mundane things, will not translate into time. It will not translate into eternity rather. Who is the Holy Ghost? Who knows the Holy Spirit here? Who knows the Holy Spirit? If I say who is the Holy Ghost now, most of us we talk about him, but we don't know him. If you ask Abraham who is God, he will tell you God is El Shaddai. You know why? He has experienced the supplier of all the needs of humanity. So he's not defining God. He's telling you an experience. Are you with me now? If you ask Moses, who is God? He will tell you, God is the I am that I am. The one that is ever present. That has authority over creation. He's not trying to tell you about God. He's relating to you an experience. They don't define a spirit. They communicate his reality. So Abraham knew the El Shaddai. Because it was the El Shaddai that gave a child to a burning woman. It was the El Shaddai that gave a child to an impotent man. It was the El Shaddai that made a man that had nothing to become rich in gold, in cattle, and in silver. So when he said, God is El Shaddai, he's telling you about the experience, his intimacy with the spirit. Moses will tell you, God is I am. 
The one that caused the waters to come out of the rock. The one that can enter into a land. People who were in captivity for 400 years. Only by his words, the nation is bound and they come out in victory. He is communicating an experience. When I ask you who is the Holy Spirit, if you begin to give me a theological answer, it's because you don't know. You don't know him. The Holy Ghost is not a theological document. It's not a doctrine. It's not a doctrine. It's a person. It's a person. He has a will. He has emotion. He has a mind. He's the third person on the God of the Godhead. And your experience of him is the only thing you can talk about him. Because God is beyond is past finding out. You can't talk about his reality. The dimension of him you have experienced is what you can communicate. And when you communicate him, his, his reality will be trafficked. Who is the Holy Spirit? I came to ask you that question tonight. Who is the Holy Ghost? Who is the Holy Ghost? To some, he is the dimension of the wisdom of God. God spoke concerning Bethany and Holiab. In Exodus 33 verse 1 to 3, he said, I have put upon him the spirit of wisdom. And he is going to be skilled in every work of craftsmanship. So for Bethany and Holiab, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of wisdom because his life is a revelation of the wisdom of God. The things that God showed Moses on the mount, the guy was not there, but through the wisdom of the Holy Spirit, he was able to create that thing, and it was exactly like what was shown Moses in the mount. The Holy Spirit in the life of Bethany was a wisdom of God. That temple that he built. The presence of God would descend on it any day, any time. It became the tabernacle of the congregation. Every time God wants to appear in the visible realm, that thing that Bezali built became a doorway to heaven. Many years later, the dimensions that that young man trapped, many years later, when the message of Jesus was to be brought to this world, it was in that same temple that the angel Gabriel appeared. That guy, through the wisdom of God, he was able to create a gate from heaven to earth. He was able to bridge the natural realm with the supernatural realm through an infrastructure in the physical world. How was he able to enter into that kind of wisdom that he could build something on earth that could host the dimensions of heaven? He knew the spirit of God. For him, the spirit of God is the spirit of wisdom. When you ask Moses, who is the Holy Ghost? He will tell you he is power. He is power. People are in captivity for 430 years. He speaks by the Spirit. And a king, the king that was the ruler of all the world, could not dare challenge him. That was the same temple that Moses ran away from as a coward. But he contacted the Spirit. But the backside of the mountain, the Bible said in Horeb, he saw the Spirit of God. And when he returned to the palace where he ran from, the nation bowed at his feet. The Bible said in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he said, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. By what means will the subject of a king become a God? Because he saw his spirit. When it was, it was written about Moses in the book, the Bible said because he saw him, that was invisible. The guy who ran away from a king, he returned to that same nation. And the king the nation bowed. How can one man become bigger than a nation? Because he saw a spirit. Who is the Holy Ghost? You ask Daniel who is the Holy Ghost. He will call him the excellent spirit. Spirit of wisdom. Daniel could travel into the dream of a king at night. He was not there when the king dreamt. But he knew a spirit. He said there is a God that revealed secrets. For Daniel the spirit of God was the spirit of an excellent being. He knew how to enter into heaven. Daniel knew how to travel into the chambers of your heart and tell you the things that God told you in your hiding place. If Daniel came to your school, he doesn't need to attend your lectures. If he entered the exam hall, by the excellent spirit, he can write the marking scheme that the teacher wrote the day before. Even the marking scheme that the teacher wrote many years, Daniel can come and write that marking scheme by an excellent spirit. For him, the Holy Ghost is an excellent spirit. That's how spirits are defined. They don't define spirit by intelligence. Because they are bigger than our minds. The dimensions of God cannot be trapped in the mind of a man. 
Ask Paul who is the Holy Ghost. Paul will tell you the Holy Ghost is the spirit of mystery. It was Paul that said, We are not, we are not just servant. He said, We are the stewards of the mysteries of God. It was Paul that revealed, he said, This is the mystery that was seen for all ages. Christ in you, the hope of glory. How did Paul know that it was possible for God to dwell in a mortal vessel? He saw his spirit. He saw his spirit. And by that spirit, he entered into a realm of intelligence that the greatest school of thought in his days could not challenge him. Paul could stand and when he speak, the wisest of men in his generation. Kings in those days were trained by rabbis. Kings were trained by astrologers. Kings were trained by witches and sorcerers. A king could look at a star and tell you tomorrow it will not rain because he is good by his spirit. They were the wisest people in their days. Paul stood before two kings and when he spoke, they say your knowledge, too much knowledge has made you mad. The kings could not understand. How does this man speak? And why, how, how do you speak like this? Who taught you this thing? He knew his spirit. Who is the Holy Ghost? You think it's about gathering scriptures. The scriptures you gathered and climbed from your concordance. You use it to define the spirit. You cannot define the spirit on the strength of your intelligence. You need to find out how the patriarchs engaged him. How did they know this being who is so wise? How did they come in contact with this God who is invisible, dwelling in the realms of Zion? How is it possible for man living on earth to travel into the regions of the heavens? How is it possible for men to download the mind of God? The mind of God, a man who walk into heaven and he will speak, he will say concerning virgins. Concerning virgins, God has not spoken to me, but as a man who is faithful, I have been counted what Whatever I say is the mind of God. You don't need to consult with God. If I speak, go to heaven. That is the same thing God will be saying. How did men know how to enter heaven? They could download the things happening in heaven. There were some of them if they stood now and they tell you now heaven is quiet. You don't need to argue. If you travel, heaven will be quiet. Why? Because they knew the Holy Ghost. It was called the way of the patriarchs. They were men of the spirit. How, 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 how? How? How, how could a man venture place a name on God? God has no name. Nobody had introduced him before. And suddenly Abraham shows up and he says his name is the El Shaddai. How dare you name a God? You don't give him a name. He has no name. He created all things. The dimensions of the earth, they came out of his voice. He spoke and heaven appeared. He spoke the waters appeared. He spoke the land appeared. How dare you give a name to him? Are you going to call that kind of person a name? But Abraham did. He said he's called the El Shaddai. Because he saw his spirit. He saw his spirit in the heavens. He saw his spirit. Who is the Holy Ghost? We have young people fighting themselves. Talking things that they have no understanding about. You don't know the Holy Ghost. And until our generation is taught who the Holy Ghost is, there will be no revival. There will be no hope for the next generation. Why do you think Islam is advancing so much? These guys are not theologians. They only know how to engage the spirit. And that spirit shocks them up. It eats their soul. You will see a young boy of 30 years. He will die for God. And all he will see is Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. Allah Akbar. He doesn't care what his life is. He has seen a spirit. And that spirit has eaten up his soul. Kill him, he doesn't count. Kill his father, he doesn't count. All he needs to do is Allah Akbar. Who is the Holy Ghost to you? You are living for your appetite. Running about from pole to post. You don't know what life is about. You don't know the Holy Ghost. You have not begun to live, my brother, unless you know the Spirit. Unless you know the Spirit. I didn't come to define the Holy Ghost to you. I know Him as the God of mercy. Because when I check my life, I don't deserve anything. He stretched His hand and He picked me from an obscure society. I was a man wandering about in confusion. I didn't know my left from my right. I had nobody to help me. I graduated from the university. There was no hope. But the Spirit appeared to me. And He said, I will make you an apostle to the nations. I know He was the God of mercy. So every time I stand, I say, Lord, show mercy. Show mercy. For me, the Holy Ghost is the God of mercy. I don't know Him. I don't know what to call Him. Mercy is called Him the God of power. Abraham called Him the El Shaddai. 
they called him the excellent spirit. I don't know what you call him. I don't know what you call him. But Paul called him the God of mystery. Paul called him the God of mystery. Peter called him the God of power. What do you call him? John called him the God of revelation. And on the strength of that revelation, they casted him to the eyes of Patmos. They wanted him to die there. Even in Patmos, the guy said, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. I was in the spirit in Patmos. Patmos was supposed to be his grave. That was the ground where he was supposed to be buried. But from Patmos, he traveled to heaven. He entered the corridors of Zion. John was carried around in a car through heaven. He knew the great dimensions of heaven because he knew a God that was a God of revelation. Who is the Holy Ghost to you? I am Kata Kata Kata. My friend Reverend Hughes, a man who was in the university, he had 17 carryovers and he was withdrawn from his first degree. But the spirit appeared to him and he said, I am Jehovah Academia. And from there, from there, the guy went and made a first class degree. He didn't stop there. He became the overall best graduate student in the university. Why? The failure he saw Jehovah Academia. And suddenly, his mental power was accelerated. Suddenly, his mental inefficacies were strengthened. Suddenly, his weaknesses became his strength. The very land where he was subdued, he came back here and he was coronated as a prince because he saw his spirit. He saw his spirit. He saw his spirit. You want to see a spirit tonight? Ask the Lord for an encounter. Ask the Lord for an encounter.
among us Zion. He said we were eyewitnesses. When he was transported on the mountain, when he was transfigured, we were there. We were there. We saw it. We saw it. We saw him. We saw him. Do you press it to God until he gives you a revelation of himself? You want to press it to God until he gives you a revelation of himself. That's why you're turning to stand it to the kings. When you know him, when you know him. Apalatata. For Noah is the God to reverence. For Enoch is the God of glory that could translate a man into glory. Noah is the God to reverence. He's the God to reverence. For Abraham is the God to obey. For Moses is the God to serve. For Daniel is the excellent spirit. Come on. Are you pressed for the nation of God? Who is, who is God? Lord, show me yourself. This came to a point. He said, if you will not go with us, we will not depart from here, Lord. We will not depart. Accept your presence. Come with us. Accept your presence. Come with us. Accept your presence. Come with us. No wonder they did many wonders. They did many mighty things. Come on. Come on. Come on. Barataka Koriata. Zedetira Koria. a man like me ever be an apostle? By what means? By what means? I knew the things I did. I knew where I wandered into in darkness. How could a man like me be an apostle? It's because I found the God. He's the God of mercy. The God of mercy. I found him. I found him. He told me everything you do. It really doesn't matter. Walk with me and be thou perfect. Walk with me. Walk with me. Today, I have become an apostle. I have become a vitalist. Everywhere I speak, people who are that look for me see, they come alive. They weep in repentance. My thoughts travel to the heart of men like needle. It pierces them. And they give their heart to Christ. I have seen cancer fall. I have seen dead men raised back to life. I have seen all kinds of sicknesses shut down. I have seen demons run away. Even death has run away from me. Because I saw a God of mercy. If you need to wander into the spirit, you need to find him. He's the I am that I am. Many people saw him and his name was documented. It was a statement of their encounters. Some called him Jehovah Sabaoth. Some called him Jehovah Ra. Others called him Jehovah Nisi. Some called him Jehovah Repair. Some called him Jehovah Tishkanu. Who is he to you? Who is he to you? Who is the Holy Ghost? You need to engage the spirit realm until you find it. Rakapateteria. Meredena Sateria Planta Sadaf. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father. Just lift your hands toward heaven. Some of us need a spirit of revival. I want to pray for the Holy Ghost to stir up the hearts of people. Some of you, it's about you are about to be activated in the Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. If you can't stop praying, it's time to receive. It's time to receive. If you can't stop praying. You ancient Zion's king. We cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty you on your throne. You reign. You ancient Zion's king. We cry out, Kadosh. You are mighty on your throne. Break forth the fountains of the deep. We cry out, God, you are mighty on your throne. You rule, you ancient Zion's king. God, God, you are mighty on your throne. The King of Kings is about to step into this place. You win. Abrasa teteria teteria. Hilal, hilal, hilal. Kadosh, kadosh, kadosh. 
Поправки драты не your life to be a channel, a gate and an access point into the earth but you have been rebellious or you have not had the ability, come, come, come come, 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 we don't have time it's a moment of the spirit blow like a mighty wind spirit of the glory God of the spirit blow, blow, blow blow, blow like a mighty wind not raise the alarm again. of you that argued whether you are supposed to speak in tongues or not. When the Holy Ghost comes on you and you begin to speak in tongues, go and check the doctrine later. <laughs> oh, I wish I had time. I wish I had time. Hey! Ah, 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 hey! My angels are coming. My angels are coming. I hear it. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear the sound. I hear them in the spirit. I hear 
limitation now. Now I am clothed with power. I am clothed with power. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Look upon them that have come before you. And begin to alight upon them now. After the count of three, Holy Spirit. Overwhelm them with power. Activate gifts of the Spirit. Holy Ghost one. Touch. Holy Ghost two. Holy Ghost three. Touch them by power. Zadadesh. 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 Kai, 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 Kai. We are out of time. It's my honor tonight to invite my very own pastor who has been here with us, the Reverend Hughes, to come and lead you to Jesus and to bring the blessings of the Spirit upon you. Come on, not welcome Reverend Hughes in the Spirit. Welcome him with tongues. Come on, go ahead with tongues. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Listen, when you gave your heart to Jesus, you made two confessions. The first confession you make you made was that Jesus was resurrected. You confessed his immortality. That's what gave you eternal life. The second confession you made was the Lordship of Jesus. That one is for service. You can keep making that confession of the Lordship of Jesus over and over. Because as you go further in the kingdom and the righteousness of God is with you, you are going to see many areas of disobedience that you need to obey again. So most of you, the confession you've come to make tonight is the confession of the Lordship of Jesus. You are still born again. But there are areas of disobedience. But you have seen another revelation of the Lord. Thus, choice excellent, Reverend Hughes. Praise the Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. For those of you who just answered the altar call, please just raise up your hand toward heaven. Just raise your hands. Paul says, Let the lifting up of our hands be as the evening sacrifice. When your hands are raised up, it's a sign of absolute surrender when your hands are raised up they are raised for God to lift them up and to begin to help you tonight we've received the ministry of the Holy Spirit and evidently the Holy Spirit is a helper you'd receive Jesus Christ into your heart today as your Lord and as you do he will drop fresh fire into your heart and those of you who are not yet baptized with the Holy Ghost, you will receive a fresh baptism of the Holy Spirit with the biblical evidence of speaking with no tongues. Those of you who are already baptized, you will be done fresh syllabus in the Spirit because God would shift you in the realm of life. Raise those hands toward heaven. High and very high. Pray with me. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Let me hear you pray. Say, Dear Heavenly Father. Tonight, I rededicate my heart. I rededicate my life to you. Jesus, I believe you came for me. You died for me. You were buried for me. And you rose again the third day for me. I declare you as Lord over my life. I surrender the entirety of my being, spirit, soul, body, situations to you right now. Take all of it, Lord. Take all of me, Lord. I am to myself tonight. Feel me afresh. In Jesus Christ's name. Holy Spirit of God, feel me afresh right now. Feel me afresh right now. Change my heart. Impact the life of, impact the life of Jesus to my heart right now. 
I receive you afresh. I receive fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. I receive the freshness of the anointed Lord. And I go ahead speaking with tongues, with new tongues, in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and pray in tongues right now. Every one of you, go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. You are receiving. You are receiving right now. Holy Spirit of God is touching you right now. Right now, go ahead. If you didn't know how to speak, right now the Holy Ghost is filling you. And when it fills you sufficiently, you will speak in tongues. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Yes, louder, louder, louder. Receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus' name. Receive in Jesus Christ's name. Receive in Jesus Christ's name. Receive in Jesus Christ's name. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. Fresh fire. By the Holy Ghost. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fresh fire tonight. Upon you, fresh fire. 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 Thank you, Lord Jesus. Go ahead and sing in the Holy Ghost. There are activations of the gift of the Holy Ghost. Go ahead and sing in the Spirit. If I speak in tongues, if I sing in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Go ahead and sing in the Holy Ghost. Go ahead and sing in the Holy Ghost. Everyone in the hall, go ahead and sing in the Holy Ghost. There is fresh baptism. There is fresh impartation. There is fresh action. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Sing in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Everybody rise in worship. Rise in the world. In the name of Jesus. Rise in the name of Jesus tonight. Worship Him. Go ahead and pray in the Holy Ghost. Sing in the Holy Ghost. Church, this atmosphere. We are men of the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. Instructions to fast, to pray, and some of you to be for a long time. A new government has been instituted over your life. That's what leads to transformation. As you live, hearken quickly to those instructions of the Spirit. The moment Jesus was baptized, as he came out of the water spring, the Bible said the Spirit led him into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. He obeyed immediately. And 40 days later, the Bible said, he returned in the power of the Spirit and said his fame went abroad. Most of you begin to receive fresh instructions of the Spirit. Do where to obey. That's where the power lies. Hallelujah. That was Reverend Hughes. Reverend Hughes is my pastor. Can you please give Jesus a big hand for him? I came with my friend Apostle Victor Ben. I came with brother Samson Otsonu. These are my covenant brothers. These are my covenant brothers. And of course my keyboard is Abba Matthew. We love you and God bless you. Thank you very much. You are one. You are one. 
this video make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend and also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message if you have any question please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you and also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ ask the Lord and personal Savior I want you to make that decision just contact us in the description Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.